those changes are definitely there and that needs to be changed in our mindset then of course with technology incorporated in medical education continuous learning and updates are there so with this chat box and chat gpt which is there nowadays the relationship of students and teacher needs to be changed from instructive to interactive uh, um, approach so we need to change our minds that we should not be only instructors instead of that we should be interactive with the students now students are coming to the class initially we had only monologue with teachers speaking all the time now students are with polylog they are having information from various technological sources so we need to adopt this change can you comment on this slide anyone can you comment please <laughs> so uh, yeah what is it like learn doing learn by doing uh, but before doing what is there what is there when you talk of educational model or domains what is there what is there yes 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 so when you talk about learning uh, we have domains of education you know basic one being three cognitive domain psychomotor and then affective domain extended by attitude ethics and communication so we have five domains whenever we talk about any educational model so when we talk about artificial intelligence even national education policy 2020 speaks about integration integrated learning and integrated approach so whenever we talk about any evolution or any technological development there is transdisciplinary integration so artificial intelligence to be incorporated in medical education it is a transdisciplinary integration so advancements we all know have taken place in technology and those advancements are now incorporated into healthcare and we could see applications of that incorporation artificial of intelligence in to be incorporated in, in medical education it is a transdisciplinary here we already are using but we did not have we do not have anything involved in our curriculum so our post graduate students are also not aware about all this that is cognitive domain of artificial intelligence so that part is missing in the curriculum we do not have anything in undergraduate curriculum we do not have same in postgraduate curriculum as well but transdisciplinary integration has taken place at higher level and we have healthcare appliances as a outcome of that so it is not like learning and then doing it we are towards the applications of artificial intelligence in healthcare so we need to understand first when we compare there is a analogy it is regarding the tree so we should know regarding the roots the foundation should be strong we should know the principles of artificial intelligence at least relevant to the um, healthcare or medical industry so so that we will be able to understand clearly the concepts of applications of artificial intelligence in medical education so understand the fundamental principles that is the trunk and twig branches before you get into leaves and details we are now at the stage of leaves and details with the application of um, artificial intelligence in medical healthcare rather or there is nothing to hang on them so if the foundation is not strong roots are not strong these leaves and uh, do not have anything to hang up on so fundamentals are the basic principles of a uh, subject so they are the building blocks upon which more advanced knowledge is built so we are at the stage of advanced knowledge applications of artificial intelligence in medical education we need to have we need to go step by step build the blocks and understand these applications in healthcare and for that sake we need to go into details of go curriculum into details of health, health administrators policy makers regulatory bodies need to think on this what changes are needed in aspect of undergraduate curriculum internship training as well as postgraduate training so now so the need of the time is wma are advocates for review of medical curriculum 
and educational opportunities not only for patients physicians medical students head health administrators and other healthcare professionals to foster a better understanding of the numerous aspects of healthcare artificial intelligence that is both positive as well as negative aspects so we need to understand and we will understand this by incorporation of all these aspect into the curriculum so transforming healthcare driven by ai need for an update on medical curriculum we have already talked revolve around equipping equipping future physician with the knowledge and skills effectively use ai applications and ensure that professional values and rights are incorporated so when we talk about professional values and uh, rights incorporate so we need to cater very important domain that is the ethics domain so ethical aspect of artificial incorporation in medical education that needs to be incorporated in the curriculum students knowledge of ai is alarmingly low we all know about this and insufficient to become future physicians their knowledge is low hence the right of patients to understand their disease and the treatment modalities that also they are not able to make them understand today's physicians the integration of ai training into medical and health informatics curricula is an important need for future physicians now what all we need to do we need to take undertake number of research projects we need to do lot many surveys to understand how today's medical students perceive artificial intelligence in medicine probably they are more comfortable with this aspect as compared to us because they are digital natives they are born in this era only so but then we have to do survey regarding this what they know and they don't know we need to see the gap comprehension of ai is ethical dimensions we need to understand the ethical aspect of ai now some surveys even to very less extent have been carried out and what they have found out out of that is that is the perception of artificial intelligence for practitioners would devalue the profession diminish its humanistic component which we have already discussed that incorporation of ai into medical education or in practice will diminish the humanistic component that is the affective domain erode confidence in patient physician interactions the trust which is very important between doctor patient that is also that is also going to be hampered the amorphous quality of intuition as art of care so in our times whatever education we had classroom teaching which we had there was like integration of humanities and medical sciences and hence art of care is practiced more even at this time so this will be hampered that is the apprehension of all the medical uh, students and practitioners and the concern about a reduced need for physicians and unemployment might be a result students because students are unprepared for artificial intelligence the knowledge of artificial intelligence in medicine so all this misconceptions or even if this cannot be ignored this this needs to be judiciously handled and answered whatever apprehensions the students and practitioners are having so this can be happen by incorporation of artificial intelligence integration of artificial intelligence in medical education so what is this what does this slide speak about what does this slide speak about so any educational model we learn anything when all these domains are catered like cognitive domain then you have psychomotor domain with affective domain extended by attitude communication and ethics so when we talk about artificial intelligence again i repeat in healthcare we have ap applications only we are at the level of skill it is like difference is like a uh, automation engineer driving a car and a driver driving a car so in that way that is the difference we are at a higher level we are directly taking the applications in our practice but we do not know the cognitive aspect of that so we need to understand learn first and then do so we need to go into the cognitive aspect of transdisciplinary integration that is artificial intelligence into medical education so all these domains need to be catered for this sake and out of that as per the survey conduct, conducted we need to work more on 
attitude domain as well as ethics domain addition of cognitive part as well so we need to brainstorm we need to think on this what all has to be added in the curriculum so these all are the domains for any educational model to be designed so ethical considerations at the concept level we need to discuss regarding we you all know about this that is data privacy and security concerns human supervision and oversight in ai driven education so human aspect should be there ai is a collaborative partner it should be kept to that level only ai should not drive humans so we should be able to design curriculum in that way itself there should be always a human supervision and last bias and fairness in ai algorithms like whatever you feed the organizers the programmers there should be no bias that care has to be taken when we talk about ai now this again a analogy human beings we need to be like software whereas artificial intelligence has to be considered as a hardware so whenever any curriculum is designed whenever we incorporate artificial intelligence in medical education in our minds we need to think that we are software and artificial intelligence has to be kept at the level of hardware only so hardware can be considered whole body that is joints muscles bones and ligaments software is the nervous system like human beings connects all these pieces and allows these isolated part to function as one unit so software is the human being and the level of artificial intelligence is the hardware this is one aspect practitioners are referring to when we they say everything is connected so everything is connected is the function of human beings when we compare human beings with artificial intelligence so how ai will help students to learn and evolve with it what all has to be done in future to um meet this objective cross disciplinary courses transdisciplinary courses need to be designed small group session should be there experiential learning providing opportunities for students directly with ai tools e modules interactive case based workshops self learning modules and student site visits to learn about the creation of ai products are among the suggested methods methods to teach students ai basics and improve their understanding of artificial intelligence ethics rather removing their misconceptions the american medical association council encourages the review of medical curricula and urges medical school deans to be proactive in this aspect in recruiting non clinicians such as data scientists and engineers we need to collaborate with these um professions also what are the challenges now educating educators we have already discussed we need to change our mind set like we need to be from instructive we need to be interactive we should be comfortable with polylog with the students that mind set needs to be changed many fdps need to be designed for this say educating educa educator seems a necessity to improve the traditional approaches and implement this growing set of recommendations besides developing the content and the methodology of specific education adopting to these those changes could be one of the most important challenges for today's medical educators state medical school faculties simply have no understanding how how to implement these changes so for all these changes for all these recommendation training of trainers aggressively is needed that is educating the educators the thing is to change the mindset we need to be open minded as a teacher we need to change our role like it is always said now it was previously it was a teacher and student then we became facilitator now we are co learner with the student so we need to be with this aspect maybe with content we are more expert but with technology definitely definitely this digital natives they are more expert than us so we need to learn collaboratively so we need to change our roles in, uh, in teaching learning so to be in education the ethics domain needs to be catered more affective domain needs to be catered more cognitive part what all has to be incorporated in transdisciplinary integration that has to be thought of with keeping in mind that apart from scientific equipping students with scientific knowledge which involves technology as much as artificial intelligence 
humanitarian aspect must be catered more than making them solely technocrat so that we as education educationists or educators we can take artificial intelligence to artificial wisdom thank you so much we will take uh, questions after the second talk thank you very much ma'am for the wonderful and comprehensive talk uh, indeed one can only count the number of applications which ai can find in the different fields across healthcare uh, dentistry is one such field in healthcare which has made significant advances in the past uh, in all of its sub specialties uh, it will be interesting to learn how ai has or can find its place in this delicate and intricate field of healthcare we have uh, dr nakul rathi an eminent dentist and co-founder of get implant uh, and an eminent dentist from the college of dentistry ohio state university united states of america joining us online to speak about ai and dentistry its present and future Okay. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Nakul, we can hear you. Okay. Can you your screen. I think they have made you the co-host. You can share your screen. Okay. I will. Uh, let me see. Share screen. Share screen. Share. hello everybody yeah uh i hope uh, i'm audible and my screen is visible just a second yes we can see you now okay so i'll write the thumbnail and i'll put this right here and is the screen also visible yeah yeah your screen is also visible please perfect thank you okay so uh i think i'll uh, uh i have uh, uh, thank you so much actually for uh for uh, letting me talk on a topic which uh, really interests me uh and thank you dr aditya and dr asha for for letting me speak uh, on uh on ai applications in dentistry i know it's a medical uh, meeting but i think as dentists we right now are using artificial intelligence on a regular clinical practice level and i think uh, i'll share a few of these things that i'm doing on a routine basis and i'm sure uh, a lot of these things could apply uh, and maybe are applying to medicine uh, as well so uh, thank you now uh, for organizing this really unique conference i think uh, uh the moment i was told that this is happening i was like let me see if i i can be a part of this so thank you for letting me share my uh, experience here All right so i'll talk uh, uh mainly about the applications of uh, ai in clinical dentistry All right so these applications uh i we can we can basically divide these applications from for diagnostic and imaging treatment planning and prediction robotic surgery and surgical applications or clinical applications patient management and patient engagement and some research and development and i'll go over each of these points uh briefly uh all right so right now with diagnostic imaging i know uh, that there are more than 12 to 13 uh applications which are currently on the market and this image is from overjet which is one of the companies right now in the us that has us fda approval for diagnosing over 12 uh, to 14 dental diseases uh these diseases include caries periodontal defects and ai i think one of the early applications that uh, dentistry has seen and i think medicine will also see it or is seeing it is uh, applications of image processing 
image processing both at a 2D level and a 3D level. And how does this image application really affect us in clinical practice? One is obviously diagnosis, uh, but it also affects uh, in patient education to a very big extent. When we can show the patient these, when we show patient these black and white images, uh, it's a lot harder for the patient to sometimes understand. And for a lot of patients in elective treatment and a lot of dental treatment being elective, sometimes it becomes hard for the patient to understand why they have to undergo this elective treatment. And having this computer vision and AI application really helps in in communicating our diagnosis and our treatment plan to the patient. Uh, this can also happen at a 3D level now where a CT scan can be very easily segmented out and we can create uh, diagnostics from CT imaging as well. Uh, after, the CT, uh, after the diagnostic is done, a lot of AI applications now have been developed, which will help in the treatment plan development as well. Uh, by that, what I mean is there are fields in dentistry where we are trying to, say, move teeth to a certain position to achieve a, a proper smile uh, or to get the teeth in a proper position. All these treatment plans are nowadays <clears throat> generated using uh, artificial intelligence, artificially intelligent softwares. These could be done manually as well, but the manual process would take would take hours, and now it takes seconds to do a lot of this, uh, which has made the treatment not just more uh, easy for general dentists to do, uh, and the specialists are are there then to only do specialty work and not do the easier cases. So it has made the treatment reach a lot more broader uh, because we've been able to implement these technologies in treatment planning as well. And uh, the in the planning, we can also predict to a certain extent what the outcome would be. By that, what we mean is, say, if I'm planning to place an implant on a molar tooth, I can very well predict what the success rate of that implant would be based on the evaluation of the CT scan. And there are models now that can predict how accurately my implant could be placed. And based on that, what the longevity of my implant would be. So, uh, and if there is, if the, if there is problem with the longevity, what the, uh, what, as a clinician, I can do is I can modify my treatment plan uh, from the uh, from the get go and change my uh, surgical or my clinical execution planning from the beginning. So these predictive treatment plan planning uh, tools have really helped a lot in uh, in clinical dentistry. Now, once the plan is made, what all do we have? to execute this plan in the patient's mouth. Uh, robotic surgery is, is fairly new, uh, but it is present uh, uh, already. There is There are at least two companies right now in the US and in, uh, in Asia, which, which are making robots uh, similar to the robots that we have in medicine, like Da Vinci and other robots where these plans that we have generated on our 3D modeling or 2D modeling can be executed in the patient's mouth. Now, as compared to Da Vinci, actually these robots now are in dentistry have become more clinically affordable. Uh, it, well, they are not cheap, but they are, but they are not so expensive. Like this company called Yomi, uh, which makes uh, implant placement robot uh, has over um, 300 installations in the US. So is it very common? It's not common yet, but I think it's getting there. 
uh, the technology is present where we can execute robotic surgery very very well um, uh, in clinical setting so uh, and uh, like i was telling you the 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 what a lot of this ai from a patient standpoint has done in elective procedures uh, and non elective procedures as well in dentistry is really we can personalize the patient care uh, very uh, and and give them a treatment modality which they will understand and when the patient understands exactly what treatment we are presenting or doing for them uh, the compliance of the patient is is very high uh, and if the patient is compliant the treatment outcome is always better so ai has has these non tangible advantages as well and not just the direct clinical tangible advantages uh things like online uh, virtual assistant uh uh system uh uh so uh, uh these online uh treatment planning and online uh, patient education systems have also really made things very very easy for us to implement and uh, and get the patient the right treatment that they deserve right and obviously in research ai has has its application for sure so uh like in a, a product development or a or an equipment development could take decades before they came to clinical practice with the advent of ai a lot of this can be done within um within sometimes even months to a few years um so at this uh slide i thought was relevant and is kind of relevant even with dentistry there are there are more than 600 ai uh devices which could be softwares as well which are fda approved which means that their clinical efficiency is as good as an experienced clinician and sometimes actually it is even more especially i think in radiology uh, there are they say computer can read uh, more than 150 scales of gray versus a human eye can see about 20 to 30 right so there's uh, the computer vision can actually diagnose and and visualize a lot of these in a lot more detail than uh, than what a human eye could and it also helps so a lot of times the debate is that well this will take over us as a clinician i don't at least the applications that are coming out now an example is this overjet application this is actually being built not as taking over what the do doctor is doing but more as an aid or an assistant to the doctor where they will be able to use the tool to better diagnose to better present and to get the patient's treatment outcome uh in a more a holistic way than uh, than sidelining the clinician altogether and when you combine these these image analysis with the learning language models and the uh, and 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 also the data that's present with the patient's history as well uh now you can start combining these two things to give you results which sometimes as humans it's almost impossible to do as well an example would be this tool from a from a company called pearl uh is it's called practice intelligence what it does is it analyzes the x-rays and it not just analyzes the x-ray from today what it can do is it can trace back the history of the patient analyze the x-rays and give you a predictive outcome uh of what that patient needs and could need also it can give you the the assessment of your practice as a as a business as well what it can do is it can identify from the history of your patient record what treatments you may have planned for a patient but have not done it or what treatment you would have missed for a patient as well so there are a lot of these tools that are present that can help
Yes. Yes. Uh, so, so these AI tools are are fairly helpful and uh, uh, being implemented in implantology, in smile designing, where AI smile design can be done, and in orthodontics. These these things I think are are the main uh, applications of these AI tools. Doctor Nakul, uh, yes. sorry to interrupt you. Yes. We have uh, will be having a short uh, inauguration session shortly. So, sure. you okay, if, if we please hold for some time. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And uh, kindly, you also join us virtually for this inauguration session. Absolutely. Over to you, Dr. Tejas. So, uh, we will we will now proceed towards the inauguration ceremony. I invite Dr. Rajasi Sen Gupta. IQAC co-convener co and associate professor department of obstetrics and gynecology to conduct the inauguration ceremony over to you ma'am A very good morning to one and all gathered here. We welcome you all to this event of reshaping healthcare with AI. That's artificial intelligence. Uh, AI, as we all know, has transformed our everyday lives with an effect on the way we perceive and process information these days. Starting from getting spam-free emails through our smartwatches, which we use every day, through the data analytics on our shopping sites, which give us whatever we have been browsing, the pages we have been visiting, it is all pervasive in our lives today. So how can medical field be immune to this all pervasive new entity? Uh, we are here today to talk and learn about this massive ocean of knowledge and stepwise we are going to start learning and accepting this as a new normal. We do think that one day AI will replace humans in the medical field. Well, we really don't know what's in the future, but we think that though doctors may not be replaced, but doctors who don't know how to use AI may definitely get replaced one day. So here's to starting a new lease of life. We have with us uh, eminent galaxy of faculty on the dais. Uh, I would like to welcome our honorable pro chancellor and the chief guest for today's function, Dr. Ved Prakash Mishra, sir. I request, I request Dr. Ashe to welcome sir with a rosebud. We would like to felicitate sir for being here. Ashe, please. <coughs> Guest of honor for today, we have Dr. Aditi Chaudhary, who is a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University and is a Google LLM expert. We have Dr. Sandeep Srivastav, who is our chief scientific advisor for the session. And also he is the executive director of DMIHER Global. Dr. Bankar, sir, may I request you? We welcome you, ma'am. We also welcome all the other dignitaries on dais, Dr. Ujwal Gajbe, madam, Dean of DMMC, Dr. Shubhata Gade, madam, Dean Interdisciplinary Sciences, Dr. Rajurkar, madam, Dean of Datamegi Ayurvedic Medical College. Also welcome Dr. Sachin Chaudhary, Dean of uh, Datamegi College of Physiotherapy. 
and dr uh, and uh, tendulkar madam who is the dean the principal of dattamage college of uh, nursing i also welcome all the faculties and delegates who are registered online and offline it is a it is a extremely heartening uh, thing for us that you have registered in so many numbers we have 150 plus registrations for this small curtain raiser today and we hope that next year when the and we hope the next year the main event of dmi hr mec conference will be a thundering success thanks to all your support and cooperation with us may i now request all the dignitaries on the dais to kindly proceed with the lamp lighting ya kunde tu tushar har dhavana ya shudra vasra vruta ya veena varadanda vandita kara ya shweta padma sada ब्रह्माच्युत शंकर प्रभृति things sir yeah i get that sorry i just said thank you so much i now invite dr ashay kevkatpure the organizing secretary for today's event to give his welcome address please uh i am extremely grateful to uh, most honorable dignitaries who have uh, blessed us with their gracious presence for uh, the inauguration or rather the curtain raiser of our dmi hr imac so what exactly is dm uh, dmhi imac is that international multidisciplinary medical education conclave as dr uh, dean madam has very rightly said that we need to come out of our siloed environment and need to integrate and toss ideas around and make a better idea or a better concept of on top of what existing right now so with that small uh, how can i say beginning or a humble beginning i would like to say that this all thing this this basic event is our work in progress so we have initiated or we have tried to light a lamp in a very uh, how can i say dark place or we are trying to find our way through a rabbit hole and we have got eminent thought leaders and we are right now uh, uh, actually standing on the shoulders of giants uh, honorable ved prakash sir sandeep sir dean ma'am and everyone and we are trying to find a way where exactly our future is going to take us or point us and we hope we will make some mistakes we will fumble on the way but we hope that uh, we can make it out with all those scars and bruises and we will be uh, much wiser much better because we are all uh, very quick learners so that is a preface uh, of why this curtain raiser is on the backdrop when we say curtain raiser we are going to initiate some activities or some events 
from today, such as the Medithon. Medithon is an integrated uh, activity in this campus and in JNMC, where we'll be uh, asking or inviting problem statements from students. We have our disposal uh, the facilities of engineering college, physiotherapy college, pharmacy college, medical college, two big medical colleges and all the facilities uh, which are available over here. And where is a better place to integrate all these ideas than doing it at uh, DMIHER. So with that, we will be initiating the concept of Medithon. It will be a hackathon in medicine. Every uh, It will be a cycle every three months or so. We will meet and assign seven teams with problem statements and try to work out a, a prototype solution for it. Second thing is that I'm very happy to announce that we have with us the founders of uh, Ortho TV online. They have joined us and they will be launching their application of Ortho AI from this very platform. So that is a very big thing. It will be a, a global launch of Ortho AI from this platform. And uh, we encourage all of you to come up, ask questions, learn as much as you can uh, from this forum and uh, try to come and give your suggestions and ideas and notions, uh, whatever you feel that uh, we should incorporate and make is this event better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashe. You have started a, a movement and we'll all join and make it a big success. So next we move on to the part which we are most eager to hear about in the morning, that is the address by our revered chief guest, Professor of Excellence, Professor of Eminence, Professor Emeritus, Distinguished Professor, the Honorable Pro Chancellor of DMIHER, Dr. Ved Prakash Mishra, sir. Truly, he is the Bhishma Pitama of medical education. And uh, whatever is his technical CV, <laughs> and apart from his extremely fine and illustrious CV, which we are all aware of, a BC Roy National Awardee, Sir's presence is a true blessing to all of us. It fills our hearts with an optimism, a kind of conviction that we can go ahead and make great things happen. We are really fortunate to have him as a lighthouse beacon on our heads and telling, showing us the path to go ahead. It's indeed kind of him to accept our invitation to be the chief guest to today's curtain raiser event. What we learn from him is his approach to each new thing. He never ceases to learn and every new data he receives, he processes it, he enriches it, he enhances it and then he serves it to us with a great panache that just leaves us awestruck every single time. This, his spirit of inquiry, his inquisitiveness is what makes him so energetic, so enthusiastic, so young at heart at all times. We're really blessed to have him here, sir. And I... <laughs> sir. <laughs> sir, evada expansion and depth kona just personality nahi hai. So I invite you. Thank you very much for your liberal yet a curtain raising introduction for me. Esteemed Executive Director for the International Global of this illustrious university. My younger brother and a very precious colleague of mine, Dr. Sandeep Srivastava. Head of Datta Mege Medical College, Nagpur, which is the host for this curtain raiser event, esteemed Dr. Ujwal Gajbe. Dean Faculty of Interdisciplinary Sciences and also Dean Directorate of Advanced Learning of the University. 
रिस्पेक्टेड डॉक्टर शुभदा गाड़े मैडम शर्मा एस्टीम्ड मैडम आदित्य लर्नेड रिसोर्स फैकल्टी पर्सन हु विल बी हियर गाइडिंग द डेलीबरेशन ऑफ दिस कर्टन रेज ऑफ कॉन्फ्रेंस various heads of the institutions in this premises or off campus of the university learned members of the teaching faculty of the various constituent units of the university invitees delegates participants ladies and gentlemen i'm really falling short of words to record my sense of accolade and admiration alike for dr sandeep for dr kekat pure and his entire team for really taking up a very very notable venture on their shoulders which definitely is not only timely and apt but ultimately we are required to be foreseeing the future for the purposes of not only making adventurous forays but for the purposes of realizing that the advent of men and mankind in terms of its growth development and progress it has always been in an ascendancy contemplate a situation that how is it various ages in the developmental profile of men and mankind evolved it was not a natural blessing it was not an accident it was not even an aberration at least the historicity what you and me have learned at men from barbary age as classically depicted as cave men the society shifted into its various domains chronologically from the cave men to the community men to the sense of community living to the sense of agrarian age to the essence of industrial age to the essence of knowledge age and now from here where it is the advent of this progression ladies and gentlemen which is something which is open ended and continuous and it is not accidentally incremental the increments do not take place in the destiny of evolution and emancipation of mankind just out of a thin air it is a collective advent of men and mankind which is pooled together which results in a classical developmental upgradation of human race as a whole did we ever realize that we will be in a position to be adventing beyond knowledge age contemplate a situation that now from the knowledge age the whole mankind is peeping into a very different age but what would be that age what would be that advent what would be the plethora of the dimensions which will be absolutely ventured into what exactly is going to be fathomed further and what exactly is going to be absolutely a new skyline which the human civilization is going to touch take it for granted ladies and gentlemen this peep into deeper forays has been the basic nature of men and therefore the transitional continual transition of the human ages they are absolutely the advents in the form of milestones in this continuous journey which will continue till eternity but during this phase of eternity ladies and gentlemen benchmarks and milestones are required to be created that is the basic hallmark that the purpose of what we are discussing today is revolving around we talk of healthcare and i'm rightly because ultimately we are talking in the domain of healthcare and the incorporation of impact of the scientific innovation and technological dimensions which already have impacted in a substantial manner and we stand on a very different footing of the healthcare where exactly what is the future and from the dimension that we are able to pursue today the futuristic dimensions of the healthcare are expected to be steadfastly progressing and developing contemplate a situation that the nature of the clinical data that the whole world is now required to handle the complexity of the data that is required to be handled it's very easy to say that health is a fundamental right which is expected to be extended to every global citizen easy to describe in the charter but this was something which was described way back in 1948 in unesco declaration 
this was something which was contemplated in wma declaration of 1949 london declaration as it is class this was something which was declared in helsinki declaration of 1964 crystallized in the formation of 2005 declaration of unesco crystallized in the form of conventional declaration of the sustainable development goals 17 in number and then we wanting to make a continuous advent for the purposes of growth and development of men and mankind but still you will be finding that we have never been in a position to attain what has been contemplated as the idealistic charter therefore the ways and means in which this particular advent is expected to be really not only evoked but accomplished turns out to be a million dollar question and therefore the developmental profile that we are contemplating in the domain of healthcare is not just an accountable answerability to the human inquisition it is giving a better world for the purposes of human habitation as a whole it is that advent ladies and gentlemen which makes the the posterity is going to be really falling back on what the posterity falls back on what you and me for the present will be in a position position to be putting across for them i was just discussing with dr sandeep whom i always take as my intellectual partner whenever i find i i i discover i don't say i discover i fathom anything new i am too small a man to make a discovery but i love to talk it out to him ladies and gentlemen we all were computing artificial intelligence is something which is known to this men and mankind any time after 1960 1960 was the year when for the first time the word artificial intelligence came into the horizon in terms of perception of men and mankind and obviously there were certain historical developments beginning from 1956 hawthorn studies as it is classically called and the culmination of 14 years study of the hawthorn studies resulted in generation of a concept artificial intelligence it remained dormant for some time and now this is the buzzword i am just wanting to put it across to you very candidly ultimately when you look at the whole gamut of artificial intelligence the mother repository of that lies in data analysis it is the effective data management and then as i said the nature of the huge data the complexity of that data segregation of that data typing of that data analysis of that data and of course managing that entire data for the focused purposes by itself is a huge challenge the entire gamut of research that you and me talk about ultimately is nothing but it is data handling and precisely it was for this reason the statistical tool which we avail for the purposes of bringing out the significance and the relevance and the impact and the consequence about that tool very classically it was said by dr wade that there are three types of lies jhoot bolne ke teen tarike hain number 1 lies number 2 white lies and number 3 statistics but yet it's a significant organ the statistical interpretation that we do is something which is going to be deciding the fate and future of what we are wanting to put across in the form of evidence the classical depiction which i am wanting to tell the whole of the data management system arose from the concept of what was discussed in the form of quantification that quantification resulted in conversion of the infinity into accessible modality a tool of numbers and numbers only prime number the whole world knows only nine numbers prime numbers are only nine and it is in the advent of this nine numbers which ultimately is the edifice of quantification as a whole and out of this quantification a simple formulation of arithmetic resulted in addition a simple formulation went further that it is meager addition which is not going to serve the purpose therefore the concept of multiplication multiplication really gave us a dimension of multiplier and therefore the augmented product thereof but then suddenly it was imagined that even this multiplier if it is raised to the level of multiplier then the multiplication will become unending and if you ask me the vedic literature contemplate the mother repository of artificial intelligence to be the square rooting mechanism basically if you look the entire astronomical calculation which perhaps has been one of the greatest extrapolation on the basis of which predictive decision making even then was made astronomically in the domain of metaphysics today is in the domain of reality what we call as the space sciences what exactly is that extrapolation 
it is basically a multiplier system in the form of square rooting which has been in a position to fathom the entire stretch from zero ending up in infinity in between the entire data generation in the form of square root mechanism it is this square root mechanism when was structured into the form of projection the mother repository was trigonometry beginning from pythagoras till today the trigonometric designs that we contemplate in various forms and manifestations what are they they are the extrapolated intelligence which is germane to the man's intelligence for the purposes of deciphering of what hitherto was not computable analytically in terms of simple addition which resulted in mother repository of multiplication and ultimately it got facilitated in the form of square root to the level of square root and it is infinity kar lo duniya mutthi mein is the mother repository of artificial intelligence therefore artificial intelligence to be viewed in the context of we generating and germinating in 1960 i am ved prakash mishra and therefore my mother has rightly named me Yet artificial intelligence is something which is incorporated and ingrained in the astronomical physics, which is the six shastras of Vedic literature in India, and therefore India is the mother repository of artificial intelligence. Is something which I am wanting to be putting across with all humility at my disposal. Notwithstanding, national pride is something which has been the buzzword in last some few years, and therefore let us let us be off that bandwagon. Let us come to the merit of the entire issue. when we are contemplating healthcare ladies and gentlemen ultimately what has been the hallmark of it from the entire gamut of clinical diagnosis in the domain of differential diagnosis through various arms of investigations what exactly are we aiming at what are we teaching our learner finally it is the final diagnosis it is the it is the diagnosis which has to be reduced down it is the deductive diagnosis that we are wanting to talk about which goes to indicate that what is the need and what has been the entire correlate of medicine it is the precision which is the hallmark of medicine therefore anything which will be sharpening the precision in medicine is something which is expected to be facilitatory for the purposes of working out a clinical decision making which is precisional in character this is the basic edifice because no human being can be managed on the basis of an experimented proposition in the form of he or she being treated as a guinea pig a human being is a human being and therefore medicine in any form one medicine contemplate the entire living being and you and me are the harbingers of sarve sukhina santu and sarve santu niramaya in that context it is the absolute medicine which mandates precision and not by trial and error anything which is going to substantiate and rise to the cause of precision medicine the end result is precision medicine any augmentation any support and that what is precision medicine precision medicine is clinical decision making therefore any instrumentality which is rising to the occasion and facilitating clinical support decision making is something which is desirable for the purpose of extension of healthcare and fulfillment of that legitimate requirement of men and man mankind ladies and gentlemen artificial intelligence by this name is one of the facilitatory mechanisms by virtue of a better facilitation of handling of the complexity of the data turning out to be a very effective data management system especially in the domain of data analytics therefore is a modality which is reserved, which is definitely catering and going to cater to the cause of ultimate generation of precision medicine especially through the ages of that it is going to be a good clinical decision making support system this is the basic dotted line in which the entire gamut is required to be structured to now when we are structuring presently if you look at it three important areas which can be said to be absolutely plagued by artificial intelligence if i am able to read right and even in terms of the global classification as it has been worked out adopted in 2013 paris declaration it says treatment and diagnostics is going to be the first part of it number 1 patient engagement is going to be the second part of it and administrative applications towards achievement of the same is going to be the third part of it therefore if you ask me what is the triangle of artificial medicine scope in the dimension of healthcare these are the three principal areas and you look at the advent of the entire modalities which have improvised over a period of 1960 till date 
finally speaking as it was said if you ask me what is the whole gamut of artificial intelligence the whole gamut of artificial intelligence which which we contemplate in the core part as a machine learning ladies and gentlemen it's a statistical method machine has got nothing to do with machine it's a misnomer basically it is a statistical connotation therefore extended arm of statistics which ends at at in the form of rocs if you want to go beyond that beyond that path is machine learning and therefore ml as it is classically now designated is a statistical approach you go on incorporating this statistical approach in terms of a small little system of input is to output by incorporating wider number of variables it becomes network mechanism be it the convoluted network or be it the neural network or be it the uh, deep learning network finally it is input output incorporated with gross number of variables and when this networking mechanism in terms of the input output incorporating variables is availed for the purposes of extrapolation and resulted in prediction that gets transformed into deep learning therefore deep learning is a advanced modality which has to be picked up and which has to be exclusively and handily worked out for the purposes of prediction ultimately finally it is the language therefore natural language processing systems they are required to be a part of it including that ultimately expert rules have to be formulated for the purposes of entire situation and governance that turns out to be a important milestone i uh, formally we have ended up in creating physical robots therefore robotics turns out to be a significant mechanism and ultimately robotic robot robotic approach is going to result in a hallmark of substantial inter area huge degree of automation therefore robotic automation if you ask me which are the five pandavas of the entire gamut of artificial intelligence i can name the five pandavas of it don't ask me where is dropadi but pandavas i am in a position to name for certainty that these are the five arms which are spread across in the entire gamut of artificial intelligence as of now this is not just the present ladies and gentlemen this is the future basically because the nature of the data which we have really not been in a position to handle if i tell you the global statistics ladies and gentlemen you will be bewildered the world is in a position to use only 2.8% of its total available on record clinical data for the purpose of generating an outcome in the domain of research only 2.8% which goes to indicate that 98% of the data even today is untouched although it is available basically because even if it is in a position to be stored through the cloud and satellitic mechanisms it cannot be analyzed for want of instrumentalities and tools and therefore our data management is absolutely glossly inadequate as a result of it the clinical data available is not getting transformed into research outcomes newness which is required to be worked out in the domain of affordability availability accessibility with accountability turns out to be a cardinal feature where it is this mechanism which is to be handled for which artificial intelligence turns out to be a way believe me ladies and gentlemen i am not an expert i am I, i always say that it is all learning is a pleasure when you are in the midst of experience instead of being with 10 fools and getting wah wah from them it is always better be with a learned man even if you are scolded day in and day out you will gain this does not end up in the situation that everything is absolutely rosy no ladies and gentlemen there are concerns and there are challenges which are confronting and men kind is baffled over as to how these challenges are to be confronted the biggest challenge that the mankind is facing in the domain of artificial intelligence is the problem of privacy the concern which which we which we take it as one of the significant features and mandates which is vested with human dignity and autonomy there is no way in which we will be in a position to work out that essence of privacy in the domain domain of artificial intelligence along with privacy yet another important feature is what is the level of accountability that you and me are in a position to fix in the domain of artificial intelligence absolutely one does not know where exactly is expected to be the source of accountability even for that matter when it came to digital and telemedicine whether that prescription which is made on telemedicine which is sans signature is a valid prescription and in case there is any error generated thereof 
where exactly the where exactly the the, the onus and the accountability lie one does not know historical judgment which came to be delivered by the honorable supreme court in the year 1993 in case of kalyan singh versus government of union of india pertaining to demolition of babri masjid resulting in dissolution of the up government and before that the kalyan singh the chief minister tendering his resignation and supreme court holding that a resignation cannot be having a virtual signature it has to be it has to be signed in hand and therefore because the resignation was put on fax and hence the resignation cannot be taken as a resignation because it was not fact and the interpretation for your only information i am putting across that the supreme court defined the word resign and the word resign was defined as resignation is not just a paper resignation is re dash sign is resign you are re signing when you joined you signed and now therefore when you are letting off you re sign and therefore re signing is resign this was the interpretation which was put across and what i am trying to the purpose of letting you not know is the legal interpretation of sign and resign the purpose is the accountability the onus which is expected to be even today not being able to be put across clearly is one of the limitations secrecy privacy accountability this is the trinity of the challenge which is confronting us and more so a larger challenge what is the domain of ethicality and what is the domain of that ethical adherence which is supposed to be guiding the entire dimension of artificial intelligence is even today baffling the men and mankind whether the ethical code of conduct which is operational for clinical medicine will be equally tantamount to be applicable to robotic medicine is a million dollar question and therefore these are the challenges ladies and gentlemen which simultaneously has to be answered and has to be accountably answered you and me cannot be sitting pretty chit chatting at the back without any rhyme reason or purpose man serious discussion these are the challenges which we, we are in the last phase of our life your generations will be in a position to be accountably answering and that they cannot be answered in a casual cavalier and chit chatting approach it has to be a serious involvement indulgence for the purpose you focus and that that is something which is mandated in the resurrection of self including the resurrection of the of the coming times last which was which i am wanting to put across is there has not been a transition of the age ladies and gentlemen which has been without the payment of price did we not when we entered into the industrial economy sacrifice the entire concept of joint family did we not recon reconcile that nuclear family ultimately is turning out to be the hallmark whether it's a boon or a bane you and me know for know it for certain but fact of the story is every transition has made pay us a price and there cannot be a gain without payment of the price therefore in conclusion the need of the hour is that artificial intelligence even today in its most advanced dimension it is not in a position to take care and cognizance of what in terms of your and my life has been designated and construed as abstract realities of life you will be in a position to compute levels but then what exactly are the levels of empathy which is needed in professional approach for the purposes of clinical medicine which robo and which artificial intelligence will be in a position to catch and comprehend when you talk of concern and compassion what exactly would be the qualitative index and what would be the extrapolated depiction of this essence which in reality is abstract but it still although mythical is the pleasing mythical reality is the way of life a pat of the back of a teacher in the sense of a praise is no substitute to computer telling you thousand times ah pat at the back and pat at the back it is that essence ladies and gentlemen the essence and warmth of feeling we you and me will be able to fill the life with data and exactitude but whether you and me will be able to feel that data is a million dollar question and therefore what is missing in the present artificial intelligence is in spite of the payment of the price which men and mankind will be ready to pay there will there has to be something which we developed and which humanity has developed in the form of not just intelligence i have been teaching my students of physiology for life for last 40 years one topic with absolute commitment is 
human intelligence versus human wisdom wisdom is not in syllabus intelligence is but you tell me what was the reason for oscar wilde to say that i do not intend to classify the entire men and mankind into two groups like men and women on the basis of gender rich and poor on the basis of economic prosperity black and white on the basis of coloration my criteria of segregation of the whole human race into two is either they are wise or they are otherwise there is no third classification and therefore ladies and gentlemen an area which definitely has to make us think all advents in the domain of artificial intelligence forays as extrapolation of the human intelligence satisfying ourselves with only a essence ki kahi zari aslo tari shevti pratyek machine cha mage manushya rahnar hai o mage rahnar hai prashna to nahi hai prashna tithe nahi sampat artificial intelligence ए आर्टिफिशियल विजडम मध्य कन्वर्ट हो महत्व यक्ष प्रश्न रह सगे आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस दरवाजा वरती पोचवे दारा वरती पोचवे तिथे दस्तक देते कदाचित अपन दस्तखत ही करूँ नुस्त दस्तखत कर दस्तावेज ही निर्मित होते दस्तावेज खूब ऐतिहासिक रह भविष्य घड़े मुख्य मुद्दा एक यक्ष प्रश्न अजुन उभा रहो कुछ ही शक्यता दिशत नहीं कि हा आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस ज्यादा पद्धति न ह्यूमन इंटेलिजेंस ह्यूमन विजडम शिवाय अपुरा आहे, त्रोटक आहे, कि तर्कहीन जरी असल तरी अर्थहीन है क्या पद्धति ह्यूमन विजडम शिवाय आर्टिफिशियल विजडम शिवाय आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस ये खरच मनसाच शेवट वरदान ठरना है कि कस या बाबती कुछ न ते नुस्त संख्य पाल चुक चुकते ही ओलावा वेटनिंग ऑफ द आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस इन इट्स प्रेजेंट फॉर्म डॉक्टर संदीप इज डल ड्राई एंड ड्रैप इट इज कैपेबल ऑफ आंसरिंग ओनली यू इनक्विजिटिव एक्स्ट्रापोलेशन डायमेंशन बट वेन आई लुक टूवर्ड्स द वॉर्म इन माइ लाइफ whether artificial intelligence is in a position to provide that warm and when we will you and me will be in a position to add that warm to the artificial intelligence take it for granted you and me will not be calling as artificial intelligence we will be calling it as artificial wisdom and therefore like as rabindranath tagore prayed that oh my father let me pray that into that heaven of freedom let my father let my country awake in his famous poetry penned at page number 14 in gitanjali i am to say oh all of you let us raise a curtain where we are able to enter from the domain of artificial intelligence into the domain of artificial wisdom thank you very much ladies and gentlemen god bless you all thank you so much sir i assure you sir we will try to strike a golden midpoint of achieving you artificial wisdom as well and we'll continue to teach our students to feel the data as well so i now request uh, our respected dean madam and uh, vice dean sir to felicitate dr mishra sir with a memento i request uh, Saudari so, sir, Tendulkar madam and Nilima madam and Mangesh sir to also join. Thank you so much. I now invite Dr. Khade sir, professor and head of the department pharmacology, to propose the formal vote of thanks. Good morning, all of you. Myself, Dr. Rajay Khade, and uh, I am going to present the vote of thanks. Uh, right at the beginning, the disclaimer is that the vote of thanks is AI generated. so on behalf of the organizing committee i am honored to extend my profound thanks uh, at the outset 
i extend my deepest gratitude to our visionary honorable chancellor shri datta ji mege saheb and honorable shri sagar ji mege sir principal advisor dmi hr we are deeply indebted to you sir our heartfelt thanks to honorable pro chancellor and chief advisor dmi hr dr ved prakash mishra sir for his ineffable leadership and guidance i also express my thanks to honorable vice chancellor dr lalit bhushan wagmare sir and honorable pro vice chancellor dr gaurav mishra sir for being the guiding stars i am also grateful to respected dr sandeep shrivastav sir executive director dmi hr global for his gracious presence my sincere thanks to the unruffled respected dr anup marar sir ceo mega group and director smh rc and dabasi nonetheless my deepest gratitude to indomitable respected dr ujwal gajbe madam dean datta mega medical college respected dr b r singh sir vice dean datta mega medical college and respected dr vasant gavande cms dmmc and also dr shubhda gade madam dean interdisciplinary and director advanced learning i extend my appreciation to mr sachin rathi dr aditi choudhary dr neeraj bijlani of ortho tv for gracing the occasion my sincere thanks to all the members of the organizing committee the kekatpure brothers dr rajshri dr bankar dr tejas dr anuradha dr nilofar dr saurabh and all the faculties of all the department all hods all co conveners of autonomous cells all the delegates who are online as well as offline the hoi of wana campus and lastly had there been no support of volunteers student volunteers team sodexo yes aviates it team logistics it would have been a fiasco thanks aditi please hello now uh, for the uh, session didactic session we will continue with dr nakul rathi he has joined us from us he is a uh, technologically uh, how can i say a very uh, innovative guy who has added dentistry uh, and ai he has merged dentistry and ai so i would like you please have a seat and just uh, understand this talk okay just please. hello hello nakul uh, dr yeah. nakul you can please uh, continue with rest of the presentation and after this we'll be having question and answer sessions sure kind request to all kindly be seated uh, we'll be having our coffee break after this hello no. kindly hello. to all kindly be seated is my screen visible yes yes dr nakul please go ahead sure uh, well uh, it's it's all, always hard to follow dr mishra sir's uh, sir's speech uh, but i think there were so many gems in that that i i thought that uh, it okay. made sense for us to uh, to really really look at his uh, instead of artificial intelligence i think artificial wisdom is what we should we should uh, approach it as and uh, so i was at, i was uh, trying to present first take it full screen sorry and real thanks to you that it is i understand it is really late night at uh, texas now 
and you have joined all the way from there and really appreciate well, thank it you so much thanks a lot dr yeah. nakul yeah so i'll i'll just share a couple of things that that we've been doing in dentistry and how we can correlate this with uh, with what we do in in medicine as well right capturing 3d data has become very uh, routine uh and this is an example of a case where uh the a patient did not have any teeth so the entire planning is done with with digital dentistry the ct scan is reviewed on uh on the computer the planning is virtually done and we prepare a 3d printed surgical guide uh there is ai involved at every step of doing this right from acquiring the image to analyzing segmenting the image planning the data of how the surgery is going to be executed and then actually fabricating a 3d printed appliance that would help us in actual execution of a procedure like that well this is a similar situation where once that 3d printed guide is made we can execute that exact plan in the patient's mouth with so much ease and so much finesse uh, making the surgery really uh, very easy for the patient and we can provide care uh, to our patients at a very convenient Uh, using this technology and i think i'd like one more sentence that doctor uh, mentioned that it was uh, i think artificial intelligence may not replace the doctors but doctors who don't adopt artificial intelligence will be replaced i think that is something which is of very great significance as new clinicians i think we have to adopt this to be able to provide the right kind of care for our patients and this is an example of the robot that i was talking about which is uh which is actually this is now also so the technology has reached to a level where we can implement these procedures in seconds and we can acquire the patient images in different formats not just ct scans but actual uh, digital data capture providing the care that can be done that used to take months could be done in few minutes to few hours right uh, just to summarize i think i think ai technology has to be adopted by us as clinicians uh healthcare uh, in different aspects right from diagnosis to treatment planning to treatment implementation i think ai has a role and will have more and more role so as clinicians we uh, should be in a position to adopt it and to uh, give that service through the technology for our patients and uh, i think engineering and healthcare merging is a critical uh, aspect in this and because of that reason i think india is really poised to make a big difference uh, in this for the world just from a from a standpoint of impact right so this only dental x-ray interpretation company that i was telling you about it's called overjet was valued at about 425 million dollars a couple years ago uh which is close to 4000 crore rupees uh just to give you a perspective a dental ai x-ray interpretation company so the value that we could create from this is really substantial and I, i and and this is just one example there are there are more than 50 examples like this where the value not in not just uh, in terms of patient output but actual real fiscal value that we can create out of this is is really significant and i think in india we have the data that we need to to get these tools and techniques we have the talent we need we, we we obviously have the products that we are using we have to make them better we need a strategy uh to 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 really implement the technology in the right domain and uh, and if we can execute this properly we can create a very very significant impact 
uh, not just for us in India, but I think for the for the for the world as well. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, for for listening to me, and uh, 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 I will be happy to answer any questions if if there are any. Thank you, Doctor Nakul. And uh, do you have any questions for him? Uh, basically, Doctor Nakul, many uh, from the dental side are online, and if we okay. have questions on the way, we'll definitely text. Sounds good. And uh, Thank thanks you. a lot. Thanks a lot for joining all the way, and uh, so we will keep you updated. And uh, I'll also like to update Doctor Nakul is our adjunct faculty from US. Okay, and he is in India for like uh, uh, twice a week, something like that. Well, two to three times a year is typically. Yeah, yeah. So he is there. So if anyone has any queries, we can get uh, get back to him. Thank you, Doctor Nakul. Thank you so much, Doctor. So now, after this, we'll be uh, breaking for a short coffee break, and then we'll be following with the rest of the lectures. Uh, I I request everyone to refresh themselves with a cup of coffee, and then we'll we'll start again in around twenty minutes. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
all the volunteers okay so we'll be starting with the next uh, session dr tejas i request all the uh, senior delegates and faculties to please come inside the hall
so i i welcome everyone back for the next part of the session um, llm or chat gpt has taken the world by storm for those uninitiated it is an ai tool that is the modern age version of that one person in every group who gathers information from every nook and corner of the world and is ready to help out those in need at the first instance it is indeed a very powerful tool and can appear to be the solution to all our life's problems how however that is not the case always and one must learn how to use such a powerful tool in order to obtain appropriate and accurate information as per the situation to help us with this i invite a uh, eminent orthopedic surgeon and a co-founder of ortho tv dr neeraj bijlani who will be joining us online on zoom to speak about the role of llm and chat gpt in day to day practice so uh, till uh, dr ashok sharma and dr neeraj bijlani uh, are there online i would like to just brief all the delegates that uh, stay tuned because we are having lots of in interesting sessions uh, post lunch in which uh, dr bankar sir and dr shrivastav sir will be taking sessions of how we can responsibly use uh, llm ethically in medical research also we have uh, a eminent faculty from uae dr vakar nakvi he will be discussing about uh, the usage the way they are doing it uh, uh, usage of llm in uh, medical research at uae okay so meanwhile let me give you a brief of uh, how uh, ortho tv is working now they have developed their own interactive ortho ai uh, which uh, they will be discussing so ortho tv is a big platform they are supporting us in a way that this particular cme is being watched over across the world Uh, not not only in india and we are very thankful to them tejas hi good good morning everyone can you hear me yes sir we can hear you okay so let me share my screen and start my presentation before i start and in the meantime my screen sharing begins can you just help me with the audience percentage how many are i hope all of them are doctors or dentist uh, maximum of them are doctors and dentists but we have got uh, a mixed crowd we have got mha students as well also mm. we have got uh, medical students as well okay and mainly mary medical field is what we are going to speak on though my talk is little bit ortho oriented but this can be applied to everything uh, so i'll begin uh, it is ai for day to day use for anyone uh i am dr neeraj bijlani and uh, i am a consultant orthopedic surgeon i have my own clinic in mumbai and i am also director of ortho tv global where this is being live relayed for all the audience to see and also you can see it later so let's start with i think this is already been discussed but i'll just touch it upon with one slide so what is ai it refers to computers programmed to mimic human thinking and learning Uh, how a doctor can use a doctor can use ai to analyze medical data quickly help diagnose diseases and offer personalized treatment suggestions thus enhancing patient care and efficiency in their practice <clears throat> so just a small article which i got around 2 months back 17 doctors over 3 3 years couldn't diagnose the pain 
and chat gpt finally provides the answers and that time chat gpt was not late uh, latest also and it was a t third quart syndrome however i feel that this t third quart syndrome would have been diagnosed much faster in india because the access to the mri in a developing world like india is much better than compared to uk or us where the access to the mri and specialist is very difficult so now we are going to talk on mainly uh, three four items the what is ai for doctors today so we are going to talk touch upon on chat gpt and its allies allies means like a pdf summarize there is something called as blink there is something called as po so what do i use chat gpt for a use case scenario i use it for writing blogs for patient education asking queries related to various subjects it could be movie related it could be medical education related it could be patient related i use it for my book summaries i don't have time to read the whole books and nowadays it gives a lot of good book summaries and i am also the honorary secretary of the bombay orthopedic society and chat gpt is a boon for me because then it helps me refine my language and write letters to all the faculties and also write reports uh so if this is an example the chat gpt is a proper mobile app you will get a lot of duplicate apps so you have to have the proper original app of the chat gpt <coughs> which uh, looks like a white color sun and when you open the app this is somehow it looks like this and you can directly start though i have a paid version that is why i have access to 4 if you have a free version 3.5 it 3.5 does a lot of things very good though it may not be as refined as 4 but it still is good enough to start with and only if you are using it on a daily basis and you miss something then you buy the version the version is approximately 2000 rupees a month or 20 dollars per month which we use it for ortho tv on a regular basis and i'll just show you a few fun example of the chat gpt so i'm going to use chat gpt 4 <coughs> and i'm going to ask it a question so most important in this ai world is now the prompt there is something called as prompt engineering which i think you'll be covering in some other uh, lecture so the prompt is how do you ask the question is very important to get the right answer so i am asking it consider yourself a knee surgeon and write me a blog on patient education of knee replacement surgery for osteoarthritis of the knee and i just send it and it creates a blog so the difference between 3.5 and 4 is that 4 creates the blog very systematically i can just copy paste and put it on my website i can even go and check for plagiarism so most of the times it is not plagiarized i can just copy it from here and i can just paste it on my website or you can share the link also for you to see it on whatsapp itself so this is how easy it is you don't need any external device you just need a mobile and if you have not installed an app the website name is chat.openai.com so now let's uh, i'll give you one or two more examples of chat gpt first and then we will go to so this is how the chat gpt on the computer looks like i'll just share my screen again and show you how it looks on the computer now, can you see this now so when you open the website called chat.openai.com this is how it looks like so again i have chat gpt 4 and 3 and there are a lot of plugins so i will start with uh, say maybe 4 because that is what i like nowadays you can even upload your files and chat with the photos so maybe uh, if there is any suggestion from your side for me or if you want me to write anything tell me asha you can tell me hello yes yes uh so like uh, regarding okay. medical education hmm yeah so i am writing on a, i want to write something on sports medicine so tell Wait, me find out it. about uh, consider yourself a, i mean for a sports specialist and about the recent advances in anterior shoulder instability that is too specific for that dr ashok is going to take a lecture Okay. But we will still so you try this. Recent advances, yes, that would be fine. Treatment. So it will give you a very generic answer when you ask a question like this. For that, we need to have a specific AI, which is an ortho AI, which Doctor Ashok will be touching upon as soon as my lecture is over. 
So as you see, this is a very generic answer for patient education again. It will not give you a specific answer. So this is chat GPT is mainly used for patient education. It cannot be used for medical uh, uh, education. It cannot be used for medical education as a specific thing. That is one disadvantage. Okay, so now let me uh, write something similar, but instead of this, what I'm going to write is, let me know about the, and write a blog on patient education about shoulder recurrent dislocation. And the same thing will be written like properly, which you can actually copy paste. This is how the chat GPT works. So more important is for patient education. More important is to write a letter. Even if you are writing a letter, you can refine a letter. And this is how it works. So beautiful. It just created a blog for you. You don't need content writers anymore. So this is how the chat GPT works. Now we will go to another app called uh, PDF.ai. So though chat GPT has started this, but PDF.ai I feel is more specific. Uh, in these AI world nowadays, more specific things are working much better is what I feel. So let me open the website uh, and see if this works. So PDF.ai is what I'm going to open. It's a very simple website, PDF.ai. I'll get started for free. I'll go to Google, sign in with Google. And I'll just put on, say, maybe online at gmail.com. And I have already uploaded a book. If you can see that two months ago, I have uploaded a book. In free version, it allows you to upload only one book. A book has to be under 10 megabytes. It can be an article, it can be a book or anything. So for here, I have uploaded a book. So let me open this. This is how it looks when it opens. On the left side, I have opened complex knee ligament injuries from diagnosis to management. Asha is an expert in this. Can you tell me, Asha, do you want it the, to get an answer from this textbook? Are you looking for a specific answer? Uh, yes. I mean, I would like you to uh, focus on management on PLC repair, postural lateral ligament. Postural so it's lateral still loading because it is still reading the book. Yes. It is a little slow because of the free version. So fantastic. I mean, if we can uh, have insights into books, that would create, I mean, Books, that articles, everything under 10 megabytes is for free. If you want about 10 megabytes, naturally you have to pay. So till it loads, I will just like to recommend everyone that do not get, you will learn a lot of technology here and uh, file is taking too long. See, it's given me some error. Upload it again. So let me upload it again. I'll just delete this file. And I'll upload another book. I'll have to search for it because I don't remember where is it. Uh, so maybe I'll just upload something else instead, which I can see in front of my eyes. There is a arthropo arthroscopy journal, uh, September 23. Let's see if it takes this. Dear sir. I mean, yes. you got a mixed crowd. So for other, I mean, you can add other students or other from uh, other backgrounds also. No problem. <coughs> okay. So no, right. The problem is that I have only ortho articles. I don't have medical articles for right. me to upload anyways. So what I can do is that I can show you something a little generic. I can uh, upload the program which you have given me. Today, there was a, the program which I downloaded, how AI is reshaping. And maybe I'll die, but this is 36 MB file is what you have made. So let me see if I can upload any other article uh, because I have only this. Uh, no. For example, the PLC is what you are talking about. Let's upload this and try. No. So it is upload limit is exceeded. Uh, let me go and use another account for that. What you can do is you can always use another Gmail account and then uh, try to do it. Let's do this one. 
so i mean in the paid version uh, there is no limit there is no limit there is no limit but then i think that basically for at least for trial basis if you are using let's uh, use this first and then only we should uh, go for the <coughs> we should go for the uh, yeah. trial version okay it gives insights also right i mean yes it will you can ask questions like you are asking any human being give me the related what is there in the article it will pick it up and show it to you yeah see now it is loading the article on the left side it is loaded fantastic okay, so it can you can ask a question related to it so what is the best implant to use for medial open wedge osteotomy so there is no specific information provided unfortunately okay you so, can ask about the angles or okay. the level at which the osteotomy is done level of osteotomy see it not only showed it also showed you in which pages it is there fantastic so this is how you can ask questions depending on whatever is there in this article though this is a four page article but imagine a book and you are asking it a question the see to it that the book is small that is the only thing which we need to see to it it's under 10 megabytes so always use the free version and then only you go to the paid version so then we go to the next part of it uh, next is summarize.tech now there are a lot of youtube podcast which you need to listen but you don't have time to listen the whole thing sometimes you're just wanting a summary of the youtube podcast so i'll just go and maybe pick up a podcast yeah can you tell a popular podcast tim ferris yeah up uh, uh, i mean if you are aware of the john oliver show john oliver show yep this one yep can you see my screen yes we can see your screen so about this say doll dollar stores let's talk about dollar stores and i will just uh click on the youtube link on the top and i will go to the summarize.tech i'll paste the link here and i submit it here and it gives me the summary and if i want i can see more wow this is this is really fantastic yes and not only this so now it if i click here it will take me directly to that part of the video wow. so it works very well and uh, but only thing is that it will work only in english videos in in english videos so though i am uh, uh, speaking more about uh, uh let me uh, there is this knee arthroscopy workshop which you conducted right this was a 8 hour video nobody is going to watch the 8 hour video yeah <laughs> so i am going to copy it and i am going to go to the summarize.tech again in the front page this is completely free and i am going to uh, just try to submit it and see what happens see because it is a long video it will take some time but it will happen great i mean we want the summary of that 8 hour yeah. new orthoscopy yeah. work workshop ourselves <laughs> and you can take out the summary yourself by just going to the summarize.tech of course all these things can be done by chat gpt but the, those are little generic this is much better see you got 2 3 hours 4 hours and then if you want to see more see more wow so supposing a speaker you want to talk about say you were saying and i want to see about plc so why don't we just search plc was covered in that yes no not to an extent but yes i mean they were uh, in, i mean some aspect of it meniscal repair you can ask okay let's see a meniscus repair see this meniscal repair is going on here now we go on see more and we can just go to a specific point uses of in patients with chronic or isolated acl is, is going on here so you can just find out where is meniscus going on and then you can go there like for example if i the meniscal repair was here somewhere so it has to be there somewhere inside here also and uh, maybe forget the meniscal repair and we'll go on uh, this acl rehab dial brace and knee rehabilitation so when we click on this i directly go to the dial brace discussion fantastic fantastic so this is how it works summarize.tech and pdf.ai pdf is for pdf summarize.tech is for youtube 
it does not work for other websites it only works for youtube but most of the videos are there on youtube yes so this is summarize.tech and i'll go back to my presentation already you saw these two things yes so there is more app which is got called po p o e it is available as a download on the android and the iphone it is a collection and aggregation of a different types of ai which are commonly available let me show you how the app looks on the mac at least and uh, i'll just share my screen again yeah. this is how it looks the app name is poe and uh, what i like about this is that it's got so many thing options that you are actually confused what you have want to do so my popular ones is that image generation so you can actually generate image which are copyright free and you can use it on your website you can even design a logo for example if i want to design a please design a logo for my ortho ai and it will help me design logo to be very honest the image i mean the brochure logo was designed on a canva ai by me yes so see this so it is just designed a few logos for you and this is what it does and now we'll talk on it also makes a presentation like for example this is made a presentation of the slides and then you can go to another app and it will make a slide presentation also for you so there are a lot of things but i like to show you something called a stable diffusion which is my favorite so can you suggest something please draw an image of students studying in a lecture hall doing anatomy dissection or maybe we'll try that next so it draws like a cartoon but sometimes it draws a good image so you just tell them to retry it will draw a better image but of course for drawing generating images there is a paid version which is dali or chat gpt which is better and the best one is mid journey which is on discord that is even better but that is all paid versions so i can show you a chat gpt version also now how it works is i mean that is the most used platform that would be much yes. more easy for yeah so let me show you the chat gpt version so the website is again chat.openai.com and because i am using chat gpt 4 i will have access to it the dali browsing analysis so if i'll tell it to draw the image it will draw the image So for that, I have to select Dali. So I'll go to Dali, and then let's see if it can create of a robot doing dissection. I mean, that would be something very much uh, indicative of this. Okay. Maybe we can do that. It's a little slow. The yeah. image creation takes a long time. See, you see that it's still creating. If I'll just zoom it, see, it's almost fifty percent created. So the image creation, the real image creation, takes time, and now it has given us two images. See this, so good. Okay, wow. And now they were doing dissection in anatomy hall of a human. Let's see this. What does it create? So this is fully paid version. The image creation works very well only in the paid version, either Dali or Mid Journey. So you have to take paid versions of both. I mean, for Chat. No, they are different. So depends on what you want to use. Da Chat GPT. If you take, you get the Dali free with it. Okay. That twenty dollars. But Mid Journey is separate, and it's a little complex. You have to use Discord. You should know how to use Discord. Yes. Yes, that's what the landing platform is like. Here you go, your robot dissecting a human. Okay. So Dali is becoming improving as the days are over, and it is almost coming near to Mid Journey, but it's not as great as Mid Journey. Mid Journey is definitely better. So with this, I uh, stop my uh, presentation. Uh, my, I will just put up with a take home message that Chat GPT mainly use it for writing. PDF dot AI is used for review. summarize dot tech is for youtube summaries and poi an app for multiple ai users you can take a screenshot of this and if you want to know more about ortho ai 
you can join our whatsapp group and you can wait for the next lecture i hand with this i hand over to dr ashok sham who will talk on ortho ai with specifications thank you very much thanks a lot thanks a lot dr neeraj we'll take questions together at the end yes yes dr ashok you are not audible as yet hello so till the time dr ashok sham yeah. actually it was host disable the thing so anyways thanks neeraj and thanks akshay for this brilliant event that we are witnessing and so let me take ahead from neeraj and talk about uh, ortho ai i'll just share my presentation and we'll go ahead can you see my screen am i audible and the screen visible yes sir okay okay so good morning everybody and i am dr ashok sham i am the i am orthopedic surgeon and also founder co-founder with ortho tv and ortho ai with uh, dr neeraj so one of the major things that uh, we as clinician face or the major thing that we can improve is our decision making now decision making depends on so many factors i mean it's it's like a matrix of uh things that we need to consider we need to use op- our resources optimally we have to provide best clinical outcomes and we need to reduce the complication of course these are the implication in terms of reduced cost improve quality of life for the patient and increase safety so how do we do this right now this is the current model it is a slow model where there is a large learning curve we take into consideration clinical circumstances research evidence patient preference and then combine with our clinical expertise to provide a proper decision to our patient and execute that decision the problem with this model is that it's a slow thing there are a lot of subjectivity in, in it it is difficult to keep update almost 6000 articles are added every week to pubmed with relation to almost every subject how do we keep update with all these newer things so it, and also it is difficult to include wisdom of crowd i mean we talk to our seniors we are part of discussion groups where we learn from their their experiences so how to streamline all this using ai so these are the major challenges that we face like i said keeping updated with literature is really difficult combining with clinical expertise and then learning from analytics a lot of us collect data but again analyzing that data and learning from it is is a difficult task to keep i mean to address most of these things we created something called as ortho ai which is an evidence based generative app for orthopedics it is built on llm as well as cognitive search model it required 8 months of hard work and research we started in way back in may june when ortho ai when chat gpt was first making waves it is a web based client currently so it is not available as a app but as a web based thing you can sign in using your google account very simple sign in is there this is how it looks on the mobile so i just signed in using uh, my account and it it starts to chat it can even save your chats the older chats the best thing is after it generates the answer for you it also gives you links to pubmed articles as well as related video links from ortho tv so once you click on it for example click on the video links it directly takes you to to debrat tapadi dr neeraj agarwal dr rajiv sharma so it takes you to the ortho tv video so it is a the most unique part of ortho ai of course it is a generative uh, app uh, ai like chat gpt 
but the database is customized by a group of orthopedic surgeons it combines the above database with pubmed articles so it is truly evidence based and takes wisdom of crowds from ortho tv videos so it has scraped all the text from ortho tv videos everything that is spoken in these videos is scraped by ortho ai making it experience based also so every surgeon who has shared his experience on ortho tv the data is included when ortho ai generates the answer so it is very useful for clinical decision making research and writing papers currently even post graduate education it can answer it can give you ready made answers for theory questions as well as short notes it can be used for i mean drug interaction is something which we orthopedic surgeons really like so you can ask a question on uh, which drug is suitable to control bleeding in tkr for a hypertensive and a diabetic so it will give you the drug as well as the doses of it the architecture of ortho ai is intuitive and responsive front end so we combined uh, the javascript along with languid to develop this ui data integration is like i said it, the database is specifically created by orthopedic surgeons and we integrated that into a vector database system which is easily read by an llm so we use lang chain however it is llm agnostic so we can change from chat gpt to to any other language model we wish to okay and it keeps on uh, like we we over a period of 8 months we learned that ai is a field which is very dynamic and every day every week something new is coming up so we have created ortho ai in such a way that we can, it is quite flexible in that sense we have kept active technological monitoring ongoing development and experiment we have kept surgeon feedback which will be integrated in ortho ai of course scalability and flexibility as the technology grows this is a team for ortho ai and uh, uh dr parag sanjeet is leadership myself dr neeraj mr amit and mr rohan are the tech team who have developed this from script planes this is a short video i'll just play it So again, ortho AI is an evolving ecosystem, and as we learn, as we go on doing things, we will get more better and more evolved. So thanks from the ortho AI team. Uh, I'll just show you ortho AI on on the web browser right away. Just in just a moment. fantastic dr ashok sir asha here you can yeah. hear me so i will show you how it looks on the browser for example this is how it is and you can sign in very easily using google you are able to see my screen right yes we are can see that yeah so i'll just write uh, dose of Well, I just inquired about dose of tranexamic acid in primary TKR, and it will. So it's my network that is slow, not really the thing. Anyways, so this is one of the question that I asked. Best option for an eighty-six year old male with displaced colitis, and it gave me a proper answer along with what are the options, and then it gives me, uh, for example, the video link for. this particular where this particular injury is being discussed for this uh, yet another exciting session so i think that's all from my side fantastic you. fantastic thanks we really congratulate you dr ashok sir for this uh, i mean revolutionary step forward in ortho tv i mean ortho tv and for orthopedic surgery education uh, we shall take the questions afterwards dr sachin mr sachin rathi is live with us uh from singapore he is the chief of uh, i mean director asia microsoft so he will be uh giving us please stay online 
uh, he will be giving us some insights what exactly Microsoft is doing in terms of healthcare and AI. So uh, I ask Mr. Dr. Tejas to introduce him. Hello. I welcome Mr. Sachin Rati, who is the Director Asia Microsoft, who is online with us from Singapore. And he will shed some light on the relationship and connections between healthcare and AI. Welcome, sir. So you are not audible. I think mute. Just a second, sir. Can you? Yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah, we can hear you now. So we can see Perfect. you. Okay. Yeah. So let let me know if my screen is uh, visible yes. right now. Your screen is visi very much visible. Okay. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, uh, Mr. Nand, Dr. Nand Kishore Bankar reached out to me and he basically asked uh, if uh, I can talk about anything which Microsoft is doing in the AI world, specifically around healthcare. Uh, so like all of you here, I'm not a doctor, uh, but I have been uh, in the technology industry for 25 years. Uh, last 15 years has been with Microsoft and uh, I've actually filed around 15 patents in different areas. Uh, and right now I, I lead the uh, security business for Microsoft as well as some strategic initiatives uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, I want to talk more in terms of what Microsoft is doing in the healthcare space. And uh, Microsoft uh, is a very heavy investor in uh, in ChatGPT, right? We are a partner for ChatGPT. Uh, we actually interact with a lot of public health uh, bodies. We interact with a lot of uh, major hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, uh, and AI uh, in different fields is always a conversation. So I'll show you some scenarios, some topics, and uh, uh, and some technical elements also uh, of what's happening. Right uh, over last uh, three four years, uh, I would say last five years, right? There is a massive massive change which has happened in the healthcare landscape, uh, and there are some numbers which I want to actually talk about. Right, so. If you look at the global pharmaceutical market, it's estimated at $1.8 trillion, right? Our patients are not satisfied with the current healthcare experience. Uh, there's a massive shortage on uh, workers worldwide, right? Uh, and then of course, I, I saw, I've been uh, listening to all the doctors today, right? The use of AI in healthcare to obtain information, to crunch information, to summarize videos, to summarize documents. Uh, I mean, those are some classic examples which are available for everyone to utilize right now, right? Uh, uh, but what is Microsoft perspective here, right? We look at healthcare uh, across uh, three different areas. Uh, the first one is around patient engagement. How do we enhance that experience? Uh, the second one is around improving clinical and operational outcomes, right? Uh, right from looking at paper-based uh, prescriptions to uh, supply chain elements, all of that. And the last one is around accelerating uh, scientific innovation. Uh, drug discovery is one example, or using AR, VR with AI uh, is uh, another area of uh, accelerating scientific innovation, right? So these are the three pillars in which uh, we deal with a lot of our customers today, right? And to power these three perspectives, right? Uh, we've got our cloud, which is Azure. Uh, and in Azure, uh, which is our hyperscale cloud solution, we've got a lot of AI elements, right? And what we essentially want to make sure is to give uh, the developers and the data scientists the complete power of AI uh, so that they can focus on the business problem rather than worrying about the technology problem, right? And then they can assume that they can roll out the solution worldwide. They can assume that they've got infinite uh, capability and capacity available in the cloud uh, to go and drive uh, AI conversations, right? Uh, Microsoft also has got a massive uh, research arm, right? So Microsoft Research is 
Uh, we've got eight global research centers. We've got more than thousand researchers who work on different areas, right? Uh, whether it is new energy, whether it is oil and gas, whether it is healthcare, whether it is manufacturing resources, uh, whether it is mining related, uh, right? Whether it is drilling and oil and gas, you name it. I mean, these researchers are constantly looking at new areas uh, and then making sure that they provide the necessary capabilities so that uh, across the globe, all the customers can use it, right? Uh, and of course, uh, associated with the research, there are patients so uh in terms of pure healthcare right uh, the, you would have heard about frost radar right now this is a organization frost and sylvian which constantly look at uh, who are the uh leaders uh who are providing innovation who are providing growth index right and that's where uh we at microsoft uh, take pride in saying that we are in that uh, growth and innovation bucket uh, at the highest, most level here, right? In terms of driving innovation in the uh, healthcare industry. So some examples and, you know, uh, anything Microsoft Research does finally gets and becomes a product and then gets deployed and used by thousands and thousands of companies worldwide, right? Uh, so some research topics which uh, are being currently done in the health space right uh one is around disease and epidemic modeling right uh then machine reading for precision machine and medicine and clinical trials uh, then uh, medical imaging ai right project inner eye how do you actually make it much more sophisticated uh, and then uh, uh, around uh, genomics which is uh, we've got massive massive uh, high performance compute gpu scale clusters which are running which can actually be used for genomics, right? Uh, so those are the four areas where Microsoft Research is doing a lot of innovation and then we pass it on to our customers. Uh, right, now at a very high level, right? We saw a lot of demos around PDF.ai, we saw demos around ChatGPT, we saw, uh, we saw demos around summarization and all of those things, right? Uh, now, Typically, if you look at it, right, and if you're building applications, you would actually think about cognitive models first, right? Now, cognitive model is essentially uh, vision, speech, language, decision models, right? Uh, and how customizable they are for the healthcare industry. And by the way, these, I can use it for different industries also, right? Uh, on top of these cognitive models, you would actually have scenario-based services, right? Uh, Chat GPT is a uh, is a conversational AI uh, content creation and a data grouping service, right? Uh, Chat GPT, a lot of it actually runs on Azure AI. Okay. Uh, supporting these scenario based services, right? You would actually need a lot of document intelligence, right? Handwritten documents, prescriptions, uh, custom uh, purchase orders, invoices, handwritten ones, and you need to have document intelligence on it. Or if you are in uh, uh, in manufacturing industry, right? A lot of maintenance, repairs, and operation documents are actually handwritten, right? Uh, and the same happens in healthcare also, right? Uh, a lot of conversational AI and bot service is a combination, right? So how do you quickly create bots for COVID nineteen or for specific uh, scenarios? Cognitive search, form recognition video indexer, metrics advisor, immersive readers for people uh, who have got uh, differently abled capabilities, right? Now, these are some services which come as part of the portfolio. And this is where organizations actually go and build solutions on top of uh, Azure, right? Uh, and then, of course, uh, if you want to streamline your hospital operations, your education operations, or your uh, pharmaceutical company operations or uh, any of the supply chain elements, right? You essentially utilize a lot of Microsoft products uh, to build custom applications on top of it. But the gist of it is all the AI services which you're using as finished products uh, actually is available uh, for you to go and build custom applications on, 
right? And this is where the innovation comes and the business knowledge comes from all the doctors who are actually sitting in the room right now, right? Uh, some examples again, uh, right? Enhanced patient care, improving clinical operational outcomes, accelerating scientific innovation. Uh, I'll quickly skim through this, right? Uh, right? How is AI uh, transforming healthcare, uh, enhancing patient uh, engagement? And this is happening a lot actually today. Uh, smart, uh, personalized care, uh, doctors on phone, uh, and then uh, uh, essentially uh, patients uh, expect the healthcare institutions to have access to their medical uh, history. Uh, booking appointments in an AI way uh, uh, is a norm right now, right? Uh, and then using wearables. I mean, this is a big, big item. Uh, we don't realize the amount of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is actually there in uh, the wearables market today, right? Uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, and of course, that gets powered by uh, the, uh, the back-end machine learning and back-end uh, AI algorithms. Uh, and then, of course, virtual appointments is uh, a very big theme. Uh, effectively, after COVID, it has actually become a norm uh, here in Singapore a lot. Right. Uh, so one example, right, and this was uh, when COVID-19 was actually at a very high scale, right? Uh, and for example, in Singapore, we were totally, totally uh, going digital on the personalized care aspect and then uh, talking to doctors, dispatch of medicines, uh, receiving it at home. Uh, all of that was actually uh, done using a digital channel with a lot of artificial intelligence uh, built as part of the application with uh, chat GPT conversation, with bots, with uh, prescription, with medicines, all of that. Right? Uh, a very, very high level uh, uh, solution, right? No, I, I know a lot of you are not technical in the room, but, but typically, uh, the way it starts off with is an online patient who is actually doing a, a conversation using initially chat GPT and then it might be a, a, a digital doctor and then a real doctor, right? Uh, and then, of course, the, the bot uh, has got cognitive intelligence around what's happening with a particular uh, outbreak, right? Uh, and then... This outbreak has been trained using a lot of internal and external sources, and it has got a lot of structured documents. It has got a lot of unstructured elements, and all of that combined uh, essentially helps the patient in terms of arriving uh, with an outcome, right? And of course, if he or she wants to do medical consultation later on, then uh, they do that. And then, of course, there's always a feedback loop to go and continuously train that uh, smart personalized uh, solution, right? Uh, this is one example, CDC, right? Uh, at the peak of COVID-19, uh, they had approximately 1,230 COVID-19 bots running. Uh, there were uh, more than 18 million plus individual users. Of course, the scale of India was big, but they were not digitized at that time. Uh, and then, of course, uh, these are some worldwide numbers I'm talking about and how quickly it was rolled out uh, to support uh, the personalized care aspect. Uh, that's uh, Walgreens Boot Alliance again. That was another one uh, which uh, utilized the healthcare bots uh, with a lot of uh, uh, large language model trained with a lot of uh, structured and unstructured data training. Uh, and then it was utilized a lot. Uh, improving clinical and operational outcomes. Uh, this was an area uh, where uh, how do we use AI to go and drive claims management and automation, right? And the second one, of course, is around predictive care guidance. And we actually saw that in one of the examples in the previous session where uh, we asked about some medicines and it came back with some predictive care guidance also, right? Uh, claims management automation is a very, very, very big area. Right, a lot of insurance companies, a lot of hospitals, a lot of public health care departments, they struggle with it because of uh, too much of manual uh, aspects right now. 
and uh, to do that we we actually found out uh, that uh, there are close to 260 billion dollars cost to hospitals on claims denials okay there is frauds around in the tune of 68 billion dollars right uh, and if we can actually eliminate errors in claims management there is a potential saving of 17 billion dollars right so these are some numbers which large organizations look at and then they decide whether they want to venture into uh these areas and this is a very interesting stat right uh a human being would actually take 85 seconds uh to check on the claim statuses versus an automated claims management solution which can actually do it in 12 seconds that's effectively a saving of a minute for every claim uh which we are talking about yeah uh and then uh, and then the last part is of course the uh the loss per year in terms of data breaches and the compliance bodies actually uh coming in between as well right so how uh we actually do ai for claims management is basically classification and digitization of unstructured documents right and these are handwritten documents these can be unstructured in any way uh with ai to permit data driven actions and this is being used heavily heavily with a lot of organizations right now and uh the way we do that is you have got the unstructured description right we automatically annotate and parse that unstructured handwritten document right uh we create some text and semantic markup on it we create marked up test uh, text and then we actually pass it to the claim specialist and he automatically can investigate the claim uh, through knowledge mining right so again uh and then this could be supplemented with a with a chat conversation also this could be supplemented with a lot of video conversation also right uh, so you can actually make the life of a claim specialist even faster uh, using this process right this is one example right uh, of nhs uh and they are uh, a very big body in terms of claims management and automation right uh, handwritten forms using computer vision uh, we can essentially extract all the relevant information uh, and then provide automation so to give you the scale right more than 54 million prescriptions per month right 24 million are electronic 30 million are paper forms okay and then uh, this organization essentially goes and uh, utilizes uh, ai to streamline their uh, claims management process right uh predictive care uh again some numbers to look at right telehealth very big market right uh it's likely to break 187 billion dollars by 2026 right uh almost all major healthcare organizations are using pa patient data and predictive analytics right they've got a lot of history of the patients uh, they just need to make sure that uh, the data is in a right uh, structure to actually go and drive predictive analytics on top of it a uh, medical virtual reality market is going to go to around 5 billion right by 2025 uh, and then of course chatbots uh, i mean that's the theme uh, because of chat gpt everybody uh we can actually build a chatbot right now right and make it really smart but this market is actually just the chatbot market is going to be around 350 uh, and then the doctor visits the medicare primary care visits uh, uh would actually uh, be 44% uh, than in person right so telehealth will become big again uh, as we look forward to it right uh another example right uh, when you're looking at uh, febrile individuals right how do you reliably identify and triage uh, individualized care guidance right contact free diagnosis uh proactive intervention uh, predictive risk modeling right these are some uh, solution guidance which we see in the uh, predictive care uh, area right now uh and again as a solution right uh Uh, of course you need a lot of uh, different types of uh, uh, thermographic cameras which are doing remote observation and classification right you're constantly looking at the uh, febrile population 
uh, use the camera, generate image, and then AI picks up after that, right? So you utilize classification models on these images and then segment populations based on uh, where they reside and if they are actually in this area, uh, provide some predictive care guidance, right? Uh, you can see that happening in whenever, I mean, I've seen scenarios where there are large events happening and they actually utilize uh, these kind of cameras right now uh, and then drive a lot of uh, guided care uh, in uh, those events also. Right. Um, this is another example uh, around uh, Volpara solutions, right? Uh, around uh, specifically around mammographic images, right? Uh, they are trying to increase accuracy around it uh, all through machine learning and AI, right? And uh, how specific they can go on each of those images uh, to drive the accuracy. Right. Uh, that's an example uh, to look for. Um, the last one, which is around accelerating scientific innovation, and this is a very big ticket item. And you looked at the Microsoft research elements at the start, right? Uh, those also feed into these uh, scientific innovation buckets, right? Uh, the big one, of course, there is around drug discovery, right? And uh, for drug discovery, you typically need a lot of compute power. Uh, you need a lot of trained data sets. Uh, you need to constantly iterate on drug discovery. Uh, and this is where cloud plays a very big role, very big role, because you can assume infinite capacity, you can train infinite models, you can iterate fast, you can fail fast uh, around the drug discovery process as well, right? Uh, and uh, some numbers again to look at, and this tells the scale of it, uh, right? Uh, the cost of introducing a new prescription drug is actually $2.6 billion. That's staggering, right? Uh, and then, of course, um, uh, the life sciences executives uh, cite uh, uh, the skills shortage as well, yeah? Uh, and then and then the aging population, I mean, this is another big one where by 2050, uh, we will actually have 2 billion plus individuals who will be 60 years plus old. So the drug discovery actually becomes a, a very big conversation again. And then I'm not so much worried about the, uh, the US number there. In India, we've got enough uh, 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 individuals to take care of. Right. Uh, so this is again, uh, a very sample AI transformation around uh, driving clinical trials and drug discovery, right? Taking uh, all the trial data, mapping them with proper treatments uh, and against diseases, right? Then map drug against disease on a personal level, determine uh, treatment efficacy, right? Uh, reducing reliance upon clinical trials, isolation, right? All of those you can actually go and drive with uh, a lot of AI and high-performance compute, which is available in the cloud. Again, a very simplistic view of uh, how the solution uh, is being done with a lot of large organization, right? Uh, so you've got disease which infects. And by the way, during COVID-19, I don't know if you know, uh, Bill Gates was uh, heavily involved in uh, a lot of these topics around uh, vaccination and uh, drug discovery was a very big area where uh, a lot of uh, cloud-related resources were utilized to arrive at solutions, right? Uh, funnel of candidate drugs, clinical trials, and then, of course, identify and align drug treatment uh, around disease efficacy mapping uh, is what the solution is all about, right? Um, adaptive biotech, uh, very large organization, right? Uh, they... Uh, they basically processed 500 million immune system sequences within weeks. And previously, the same immune sequence would have taken them 29 years to execute, right? Uh, and that's the power of uh, AI, machine learning, and the cloud, which will help in uh, driving drug discovery even faster you know, in the next couple of years. So a little bit more details for you to look at. Uh, right, uh, but 
uh, it did utilize machine learning um, right but to the scale uh, of uh, actually driving uh, a lot a lot of uh, innovation around drug discovery right uh, there's one more last element and i'll close my session and uh, wait for questions is how do you actually uh, uh, make ai more responsible right uh, and for that inside microsoft we actually have got the uh, responsible ai principles and you know we deal with every organization you can think of in every industry right right from nuclear reactors to uh to healthcare organizations to defense organizations to uh manufacturing to oil and gas you name it right and everywhere we have to think about ai uh from a principles perspective right uh how do you actually have fairness uh in terms of ai how do you actually go and drive transparency uh around that how do you make people accountable who deploy and build ai systems right um, right because today if you ask something to chat chat gpt it will give you an answer uh, but how do you surround it with a domain model how do you surround it from an accountability perspective and make sure that it is actually giving you uh, real relevant uh, outputs uh, how do you make uh, ai reliable right uh, how do you actually go and drive privacy and security uh, privacy is a big aspect right uh in terms of uh, misuse of uh uh privacy data and then uh, the last one is around inclusion right uh, how do you empower uh everybody and anybody to build uh uh applications to have channels of feedback uh in terms of ability and engage people to provide a real quick uh guidance in terms of inclusion right so so we do look at ai principles in a very very strong way because uh, we do understand uh, it's a very nascent technology it can disrupt a lot of things and it has got a potential of actually being misused a lot yeah with that i will stop right uh, but in in summary right uh, ai is a game changer um if you are a startup uh of course you can build a lot of uh, brilliant solutions with it if you are uh, a pharmaceutical company of course you can expedite your journey around a lot of uh, research aspects if you are a medical devices company you can inject it with a lot of ai in it if you are a hospital you can actually go and drive a lot of automation uh, with different scenarios if you are into education uh, in healthcare uh, the new wave of doctors who are coming out have to gear up in terms of how it changes their day in a life right with that i'll stop and thank you so much for this opportunity really appreciate it thanks a lot thanks a lot mr sachin it was a extremely extremely educative as well as informative and a sort of eye opening lecture and it is uh, how can i say imperative to know what big guys are doing like microsoft so that we can i mean we, we can expect a lot of good things in the future only two questions from the audience because mr sachin has to leave so anyone want to ask anything so one question i mean you may find it like slightly corny how can we participate as an institute uh, in this big uh, way i mean the way microsoft is doing how can you involve dmi hr or uh, i mean a lowly orthopedic surgeon like me to be a part yeah. of your project so so we you know inside microsoft we have got a founders hub right founders hub is where we actually support a lot of uh, uh, startups uh, and a lot of companies who actually want to come and innovate with us and as part of the founders hub uh, you actually get a lot of free resources on the cloud right so if you want to utilize ai capability if you want to utilize compute capability to go and drive specific areas right that's one Uh, so having access to the best of the technology platform is first area so my recommendation would be to go and register yourself as a startup as an organization on on founders hub the the second element um uh, which we have got is uh, is more around a lot of uh, independent software vendors who operate in the healthcare area 
they are always looking out for subject matter experts to go and enhance their product line. And we bridge that gap by introducing subject matter experts with the potential solution providers. So that's again a marketplace where you can actually come in and then say, hey, I'm a subject matter expert around ortho, around on, uh, oncology, around dental, around any of these areas. Uh, and then we can bridge that gap in terms of research, in terms of uh, rhythm of business, in terms of operational excellence, all of those areas, right? So two areas you can actually start participating. And the third area, I think you all are using chat GPT right now, which is a good thing. Uh, uh, but my recommendation would be to surround it from a ethics and responsible AI perspective, right? Anytime you're arriving at a conclusion, uh, make sure that uh, it, it has got that element because uh, it is still learning. Chat GPT is, uh, think of it like a baby who is uh, just three years old right now. And it has to grow to be a doctor. And and you all know that to become a doctor, you have to study a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mr. Sachin. I mean, we are really looking forward for the next year uh, of... Uh, just a second. There is one question from our director, Dr. Sandeep Srivastava, sir. Yeah. Okay, congratulations for fantastic talk. To take a clue out of it, I would like to know how far are we from having a I'm an orthopedic surgeon, the patients in between us, AI based doctor. Okay, I, I lost the question, doctor. Can you please repeat it for me? Between me and my patient, how far are we to have an interposition of AI based doctor? So, but, so, you know, but just like we've got generics, right? Generic medicines, if you look at it, right? Uh, I mean, chat GPT can actually do that for you right now, right? On the generics front, uh, all the chatbots and the digital doctor frameworks, if you look at it today, uh, they provide that initial answer really quickly. But when it comes to specialized uh, uh, areas, I think we are still far away. We are still far away. We still need that physical individual and that that emotional connect to help us out in terms of uh, resolving a medical problem. So we will definitely discuss this during our like my lecture I included. So uh, any more questions? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sachin. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so, so much. For nice talk regarding figures and all these things. Huh? Yeah. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation as a speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So next up, we have a graduate from Bets Pilani, a PhD from the Carnegie University, Mellon, USA, a Google LLM expert and a research scientist at Google Research USA, a secretary of special interest group for endangered languages under the aegis of Association of Computational Linguistics and the guest of honor for today's session. I welcome Dr. Aditi Chaudhary to speak on synthetic language generation and its role in healthcare. Um, at this stage, I would also like to thank all our esteemed faculty members. We feel privileged um, that we have such an eminent faculty with us today who are guiding ignorant and lost souls like myself in this uncharted territory of AI and healthcare. Thank you very much. Please welcome Dr. Aditi Chaudhary with a huge round of applause. Hi, thank you for the very kind introduction. And I'm also very thankful to the organizing committee for giving me this platform and all of you who are here in person and those who are in virtually. Uh, and I have a bit of a cold, so please bear with me. Uh, so today uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, synthetic language generation and its role in healthcare. So before we dive into it, I just wanna give a one sentence overview of what is AI. So AI is basically all of the systems which help uh, machines think, process, and perform tasks as a human being would do. And with the recent, with all of uh, that you have seen so far in the talks, and you might have seen in newspaper articles, uh, in the fa past few decades, or in fact, in the last decade itself, the uh, progress in AI has been phenomenal. With AI models now even uh, performing uh, standardized tests at an expert level, like solving USMLE, uh, SAT problems and so on. So how have we reached at this point so quickly? Uh, and that has been because of the many advancements and developments in many of the subfields which make up AI. 
so this is a very nice figure which gives a short summary of all the fields, but of course not inclusive of all the different fields. So for instance, a major contributor to this has been the field of machine learning, which deals with uh, developing statistical algorithms that teach the model to solve new tasks. And within machine learning, the field of deep learning has led to uh, this uh, progress in AI, wherein the development of artificial neural networks have enabled the models to learn a lot of these complex patterns from large data sets. And my specialization lies in the field of NLP, which is natural language processing, that basically deals with the language component of AI system. That is how computers analyze and process natural language, like you and I are talking and communicating in both spoken and written form. And of course, uh, we also have domain knowledge, like statistics, uh, medical knowledge, which all of these allied fields make up a good AI system. So let me just give a quick overview of some examples. Uh, uh, you've seen a lot, many of them, so I'll just briefly go through them. So uh, let's say a patient comes to you and says, what are the foods I should avoid if, um, if they have a rosacea, which is a condition? And uh, you might know some of the foods on top of your head, but you might not remember all of them. So what would you do? You would either go and search on Google for articles, or you might even get back to your medical books. It takes time. Time. So what if I tell you that you can just enter your question on a tool and you will get an answer, summarized answer, which tells you that, okay, spicy foods or alcohol should be avoided. And even the clinician above has given a similar recommendation. So this is such a handy tool to have because it now saves you a lot of manual effort of searching. So this is an example of a Google released model. It's called MedPalm which is basically a question answering or a model to provide summarized answers to your medical questions. And of course, everything comes with a pinch of salt because this needs to be verified. And of course, it will tell you from what all books it got this answer from. But this is a very time saving and efficient way to retrieve medical knowledge at the tip of your hand. So this is an example of an information retrieval application for healthcare. So what other tasks could AI help with? So one of the key things in AI is machine learning. And then machine learning is algorithms. They are really good at finding patterns. So let's say, uh, like all of us have listened the, uh, since morning, that we have lots and lots of data. The doctors come in. You have hundreds of patients. You have their notes written in your handwriting. And now, if you want to summarize or put this into a digitized format, you again have to spend a lot of manual effort. So now, if I say, you don't have to do that. There are already tools we can, which can easily identify salient information directly from the natural language text. So if a doctor wrote such a thing for you, then the, the system will automatically identify that, okay, ribavirin is a medication name, um, the disease was in the GI tract, and so on and so forth. So you can automatically convert information which is there in just natural sentences into a tabular format or a structured data. Similarly, with not just uh, language or sentences, you can also do this with images. So nowadays, there's a lot of applications where the ML algorithms can directly look at x-rays and identify whether the patient has tuberculosis cavity or not. So all of this information is not there, or all of these tools are not built to like replace doctors, but rather to assist them in their process. So think of a time when the pandemic was there and there was such a big patient load and you didn't have infrastructure to like do the CT scans or MRI scans. So how, how will you prioritize patients which have more infection than which do not have? So such kind of automated tools can quickly help in prioritizing patient load and so on. So these are just some examples. Uh, another very cool application of AI is in disease modeling. So even in pandemic, we saw a lot of these charts that, okay, the virus is gonna peak in the months of January, then it will go down in the months of March or April. So such kind of predicting future events from past events is a very useful strategy for preparing hospitals or doctors and making sure that you have the right infrastructure, medication, and so on and so forth. So AI and machine learning algorithms are really, really good at this. But how does AI work? Like how are all of these applications possible? So at a very high level view, there are three main components to a good AI system. The first is training data. So training data is basically examples of expected input and expected output. Over this data, a machine learning algorithm is learned, which basically teaches the model how to solve the task at hand. 
And finally, we also need some way to evaluate the learned model automatically because uh, nobody can spend so much time analyzing each and every output. So we just need some way to automatically evaluate whether the model has learned as expected. So in this talk, I'll specifically focus only on the training data, which um, even our honorable guest uh, had said that data is everything today in our AI systems. So let's go back to our application of information retrieval, where basically we given a question by let's say a doctor and there are like lots of articles on internet. We want a way to quickly say which article has the answer to that question. So in this case, your input is basically the user query and your a pair of documents, for instance. And the expected output will be how relevant that document is to the query. So clearly for this question of what foods to eat to avoid hypothyroidism, the first article is very relevant. It will contain all the answers or some of the answer. But the second document is talking about foods for healthy hair growth. So clearly it is not relevant to the question. So this is the kind of expected input and output that a model would need to learn how to solve this task of information retrieval. And the model will need lots and lots of such examples to understand the pattern on how to solve this task. So training data construction is the most important step in any AI system. In fact, data is now the new oil. Because even if you have the perfect model in the world, if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. So data is just everything. So what are some qualities of a good training data? The first and foremost is quality. So let's say you have a task which deals with images. So having a high resolution image over a low resolution one will be better because then you will be able to see all the aspects of the car like here very clearly. Of course, quality could mean differently in different contexts. Let's say if you are building a system for analyzing electronic health records, then having genuine true information about all the aspects of the patient, let's say, uh, when they first came in, then what dosage was given, what happened. So such kind of good quality information is required to get a good AI model. Second is quantity. So in this case, if you uh, just show the model, just one example of an instance, it might just learn very spurious correlations. For instance, if you just show the left-hand image of single instances, it might just learn that, okay, any packet in yellow is lace. That is not correct because lace can come in many different colors. So we want the model to understand what the task is and what the pattern is to identify or solve that task. So for that, we need to give the model multiple data samples from different, different perspectives. So related to that is the diversity aspect. So for instance, in, the, in this case, we have images of buildings. So diversity here could mean showing buildings uh, at different locations, showing pictures of buildings at different day times, like how it looks um, at 5 p.m., how it looks at 11 p.m. This will bring diversity and will make the model more robust. Again, diversity could mean differently in a different task. So if the task was say to identify uh, faces of a person. So in this case, we might want to show faces of different genders like male, female, different age groups, and also maybe different ethnicity. So we want to show the model a comprehensive representative data set sample so that the model doesn't just get biased towards one particular sample set. So clearly a lot needs to go into the data creation process, data verification, data labeling. And this is a very nice chart, which basically allocates or which tells us that almost 70% of the time in any AI project or machine learning project just goes in data creation, uh, data labeling, data augmentation, which how, how to collect data, what questions to even ask in the first place, because everything starts from here. And the machine learning model training is just maybe 15 to 20% of your time. So clearly, this requires a lot of time. But at the same time, this is a very expensive process because it requires a lot of human uh, effort and time. You also need to train humans on what questions to even ask. You can't just put in all the data you have directly to a system. It won't know what to do. You have to uh, create proper data sets, so what inputs, what outputs, what is your task. So this is a very time and cost intensive process. So now there is a new upcoming uh, research uh, field for this is that if real data collection is taking time, so could we at the meanwhile augment this data by creating new data automatically using existing AI models? And given that the progress in AI has been such phenomenal in the last few years, 
especially with these large language models like, uh, like uh, chat GPT from OpenAI, Bard from Google, which can generate even human-like language. They can even summarize uh, uh, good uh, problems. They can even solve mathematic problems. So now we can directly use some of these very strong language models to like at least create some temporary data for us till we have enough data collected in the real world. So for instance, let's take the same example that we want query document judgment pairs. So in this case, I can just take any document. In this case, it's about a premature ventricular contractions. And I can just put it, uh, put this input into the AI model, let's say BARD or chat GPT, and just say, generate a query whose answer may be in this document. So the model just gave me a question like, what is cardiac testing medical terms? So this is, as you can see, it is somewhat relevant to the in input document, if not completely relevant. But such kind of input output examples will at least teach the model what the task is, that it needs to identify the relevant documents to any given query. So we can just create any kind of uh, temporary or synthetic data to solve the task at hand. And not just in English, but now these models also have the capability to create or generate data in multiple languages. Of course, the quality is still better for English because, again, we have a lot of data for English. But as the uh, progress in AI continues, you might as well see uh, such kind of data in Konkani or even like any other dialect uh, in India. And not just... Um, for text, but you can also now, as you saw images from DALI and um, GPT, you can even create images which you can use to augment your real data. But like any technology, everything has its limitations, which all of us should be aware of before we use it in practice. So ideally, real good quality data is always the best. And the reason is because some of these large models, a very common problem is that they tend to hallucinate, that is to generate incorrect content. So for instance, um, there was this article on the news that one of the users given input, tell me a fact about George Washington. So the a one of the AI models said, George Washington was known for inventing cotton gin. But this is not correct because in reality, Ellie Whitney was the person who invented the cotton gin. So clearly everything needs to be taken with a pinch of salt because AI is still learning as many people have pointed out. It has everything, but it's still struggling with some of these aspects. So we should always like not rely on it completely, but take everything with a pinch of salt. And especially in the case of healthcare and medical where the cost of error is just like, it's unimaginable. Like if you make a mistake like this, then it's, it's not, not forgivable. It might have very bad consequences. Another very uh, common issue with AI models is that sometimes they have bias, inherent bias in them, which again is because of the data from which it was learned. So there was this article a couple of years back where AI was associating certain occupations with certain genders. So if you say, tell me the gender of a doctor, it would just say male. But if you say, tell me the gender of a nurse, it would say female, which is clearly not correct because we all have, we, we have female doctors here right in the room with me. So this issue again links us back to the data problem, because if the model has only seen instances of male doctors, then the model doesn't know that, okay, even females can be doctors. So this again goes back to data curation. And some of these problems have now been identified because some of them, these models are now being used. So work is going on to fix these problems. But this is something like, this is just a few examples of where AI is struggling and there's a lot of scope of improvement in these models. So given that we have this a, a, a capability of generating synthetic data, where can we use it in healthcare applications? So one of the very popular is that when you don't have any uh, real data uh, and you have new and unseen domains coming up, then we can quickly create uh, data to bootstrap the system. So for example, uh, let's say I wanted to create an information retrieval system for COVID-19. So uh, up until like two years back, there was like no data of COVID-19 on the net. So then how will you build a system? Because you also, at the time, you, you needed quick systems to get you relevant information from across the world. What, what were the symptoms in Brazil? What were the symptoms in Singapore? So in this, in such a case, you having the ability to augment your real data with synthetic data will provide a good starting point for an AI model. A second major application of synthetic data is in protecting user privacy because a lot of the medical data deals with patient information and you don't want this information to be leaked. 
but at the same time you want the uh, model to perform correctly as well so there are a lot of uh, research going on on how to maintain the performance of the ai model but without violating the patient privacy another very common application is for missing data so as we saw earlier the model only knew about male doctors it didn't know about female doctors so synthetic data can be used to like fill in any missing information so that the model that we learn is a good and robust model and there are such examples of tools like um, synthia or md clone which uh, have been used to generate synthetic electronic health records from real uh, electronic health records and these can be used to like create good ai models say for predicting uh, disease outbreaks or for simulating anything uh, like a particular condition so there are approaches to now use synthetic data without relying on real data and there are a lot of these problems that are discussed but there are some very unique problems in the indian healthcare sub community which uh, is very interesting the languages or they might even mix marathi with hindi with english so current uh, currently these models are not really good at even just one language but how do you deal with the fact that one word in a sentence is marathi second word is hindi so there is a lot of these important challenges okay thank you so much for this opportunity um, uh, mr nand dr nand kishor bankar reached out to me and he basically asked uh, if uh, i can talk about anything which microsoft is doing in the ai world specifically around healthcare uh, so like all of you here i am not a doctor prescriptions uh, custom uh, purchase orders invoices handwritten ones and you need to have document diligence on it or if you are in uh, uh in manufacturing industry right a lot of maintenance repairs and operation documents are actually handwritten right uh, and the same happens in healthcare also right uh, a lot of conversation on ai and bot service is a combination right so how do you quickly create bots for covid-19 or for specific uh, scenarios cognitive search form recognition video indexer metrics advisor immersive readers for people uh, who have got uh, different able capabilities right now these are some services which come as part of the portfolio and this is where organizations actually go and build solutions on top of uh, azure right uh, and then of course uh, if you want to streamline your hospital operations your education operations or your uh, pharmaceutical company operations or uh, on your supply chain elements right you essentially utilize a lot of microsoft products uh, to build custom applications on top of it but the gist of it is all the ai services which you are using as finished products uh, actually is available uh, for you to go and build custom applications on right? and this is where the innovation comes and the business knowledge comes from all the doctors who are actually sitting in the room right now right uh some examples again uh right enhanced patient care improving clinical operational outcomes accelerating scientific innovation uh, i quickly skim through this right uh right how is patient uh, engagement and this is happening a lot actually today uh smart uh, personalized care uh doctors on phone uh and then uh, name this last name in this of course it will have errors but compared to doing everything from scratch correcting errors is much easier so you might just benefit from saving a lot of time by using all of these existing tools so sorry you have just to interject uh would you recommend using a video tool like if we if we record our video record our patients conversations mm -hmm. of course with prior yeah. uh, permission and consent it would be easier to digitize that data because we have we saw the way dr uh, neeraj vijlani has showed like summarized tech mm -hmm. it can uh, i mean technologically convert any kind of a video communication into a summarizable platform yeah, or right. data so would you think that would make it easy 
so I think maybe if everything was in US American English, because a lot of the models are trained on that kind of the data. But in the Indian context, I don't think we have that kind of uh, data available to train such model. It is in progress. So I'm sure in like maybe next one or two years, you might have it readily for available for Hindi, Marathi or the major Indian languages. But given that uh, a lot of the times also, there is sometimes it also happens that there is noise in the video recording system itself. So all of these things will add a lot of noise. So I think my feel is that at, at least currently going from text would be much easier and less erroneous than going from video only because that the technology is not there yet. Fantastic. For the uh, Marathi and all those things, you are there. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. And my query is how AI can be used in medical education, mm -hmm. like teaching, learning tool as a teaching, apart from chat GPT. Right. Uh, so uh, that's a very good question. So one is in information retrieval. So you can like, uh, if you want to like uh, show some examples of, let's say you are illustrating a particular uh, condition, like, um, I don't know, my, my knowledge is very poor, so I'm just going to come up with very basic examples, but like how diabetes is, uh, what are the different um, uh, what are the different uh, medications from diabetes happening so around the world so such kind of tools are, are going to help you give you a good summarized content of what is happening around the world which you can share with your students that is one thing second thing is apart from uh, like information retrieval from text side like you had images like dali which can illustrate things directly using an image. So let's say your textbooks don't have this kind of images to help understand how this procedure is conducted. So you can very well just create a synthetic image or a video using chat GPT or whatever the next tool that will come up. And you can use that to help illustrate the students. Okay, this is how a surgery is being performed. So this could be a good way to prep up the students uh, directly. So information retrieval, then showing illustrative examples is a very good use case of AI. But also, again, this cannot happen just by, uh, by relying only on AI. The teacher, it, AI is to be considered as an assistant for the teacher because there's a lot of issues with hallucination, incorrect text. So the teacher, like a human expert should be in the picture, but AI can help you facilitate it in a much faster and efficient manner. So. Thank you, Dr. Aditi. Uh we would like to felicitate her. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I would now like to request uh, Dr. Ashay Kekatpure to felicitate Dr. Aditi Chaudhary with a memento as a token of our appreciation and for sparing our valuable time to be with us for the session today. And nowadays, uh, we see many AI anchors on television. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On Aaj Tak and uh, many news channels, one uh, AI anchor comes. Aaj Tak is the first channel. So uh, I, when I look at that, I always uh, think, can there be one day where teachers will also be seen in the classroom in the form of anchors, AI anchors? Will Is it? Is uh, there? I, I think there is, I think it's already in practice. So it is in practice. as in like not at a very extensive level, huh. but you have online AI tutors in a way, which can sort of like, let's say I am teaching you or you are teaching me a concept hmm. and you, you, you can have an AI agent with you. You can say, okay, hey, uh, I'm telling my students about uh, the diabetes type two. Uh, give me some examples of how this was, uh, what the medication was in the 1970s. Okay. So that, it might just help you give that information right away. Or you might say, okay, like um, come up with a question paper for uh, on the topic of physiology. Mm -hmm. So AI, because it has access to like, not just AI, but because it has access to a lot of data, it will save you a lot of manual effort. It might come up with some information which you might have just missed out on because okay. we, can, we can't just store everything in our brain. Okay, so it, right. it's like a secondary brain for us to like just retrieve something. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much once again. Um, so now, now that we have all this information about AI in healthcare, uh, I think it is uh, very important to understand the current status and situation of the use of AI in healthcare. It is only after we know our position that we can start branching out and molding ourselves uh, according to the things we need. Uh, 
uh, also we always start to learn new things out of interest or out of curiosity but soon enough during the learning process it is our natural or human intelligence which starts attaching expectations maybe realistic or unrealistic to this newly acquired skill similarly learning ai is bound to be associated with certain expectations which will vary from from person to person uh, i now welcome on stage dr ashay kekatpure professor in the department of orthopedics at smhrc who is also a phd in artificial intelligence and orthopedics to help us make, help us and make us aware of where we are at with ai in healthcare its building blocks and expectations welcome sir okay after lot of a uh, technical thing i mean some kind of a perspective from a surgeon and uh, this talk is more about my journey okay how we need to start or how we can uh, connect to each one and make some kind of a, how can i say a, a data interlinkage a uh, lot of uh, buzzword around the world, around the thing called as data ai so uh, i would like you to see this talk basically as a refreshment so this is first and foremost my disclaimer this is work in progress okay this entire journey we need to remember what the title of this particular cme is the title is that it's a curtain raiser okay we are raising the curtain and i want you all to begin with me in this journey towards understanding or discovering what exactly we can do with the available tech with the available gadgets with the available information that we have at our disposal and how can we work and amalgamate it into something useful which can solve problems at our own local level so with it and with that in mind i just want you to have a look at this particular video this is something fun Looking but as we all know life always follows art okay just have a look it is a funny take on the situation right now what One they are trying to discuss thoda sound badhayega means the new graphic design ai aims to automate graphic design and could make relax because in a future where ai does most of the work there will be one thing that humans will finally get to do all the love nothing so it's time to learn the most essential skill of the future five star presents Let me check the So but this is the reality this was published on November uh, 31st I mean 30th two and three physicians are concerned about how ai is driving diagnosis and treatment decisions in the survey it is coming in a big way we also need to know on 22nd of november 2023 there was a big global summit in which all the leaders assembled and discuss what is the meaning of futurative ai and its safety instructions related to human race in being but to the extent right now the ai which is available at our disposal for me and you to use is nothing like the one we we saw in movies okay it's nothing like that okay so what exactly is artificial intelligence i think it has been very well covered by all the speakers before it is a capacity given by humans to machines or statistics to memorize and learn and from experience to think and create to speak judge and make decisions which are always supervised so there are multiple forms there is supervised there is unsupervised and there is reinforcement learning when i say that supervised learning okay you teach a particular model or a agent is that okay this is a fracture this is not a fracture that is supervised learning unsupervised learning is that when that model goes ahead and makes the diagnosis and reinforcement learning is when the model you just give them a set of rules and it comes with a decision or a diagnosis the best example of a reinforcement learning is when alphago defeated the world champion alphago is a game of a chinese strategy game which was considered imperceivable because the number of moves in alphago 
are equal to the number of atoms in the universe and uh, there was a general perception that no one can defeat a human being in alphago but uh, two years back uh, an ai defeated a human being so what exactly is artificial intelligence it is a combination of machine learning neural networks natural processing and robotics i am not an expert okay i am just a fiddler who is trying to understand what exactly it is and what it means for me and i am i am trying to figure out why what is the why of ai what it is going to mean in my practice for a simple example as we had discussed we were discussing outside this is a, to an extent what we have progress is if it is a 61 year old with a 57 year old and a 73 year old the ai with uh, any any i mean all orthopedic surgeons can make out that there is a fracture so at present with computer vision we also can make out that there is a fracture but whether this radius fracture will be managed enough with a cast or does it need surgical treatment this kind of a predictive value can be generated by the use of ai and there is a calculator for that which is a radius instability calculator which gives you a diagnostic support system upon which you can build your treatment plan whether you to treat this fracture with a cast or whether you need to operate because if you make or involve the patient also and this dds system or uh, in your uh, treatment protocol it gives you a better idea what exactly you need to do so of all things we need to seek some kind of understanding on what level we are working and where we need to go so as a orthopedic surgeon i am trained at various places around uh, india and this was the usual work profile so this is my journey i am just need to uh, discuss it and it was a pretty good routine life unless and until this idea came so i just was traveling around just finding out better ways to do my surgery so that landed up me in japan so what happened in japan was that i came across this uh, this insight uh, the company over there kyocera they were beginning their research in ai based image recognition to help diagnose skin diseases and they were going to make it uh, on a uh, on a commercial base so that triggered a uh, how can i say the idea that how does this landscape of ai in healthcare appears to me and what am i going to do about it because definitely in some or the other way it is going to affect each and every one of us sitting in this room as with all disruptive technologies go disruption is going to change the way we perceive our present tense because as they say future is definitely only a matter of attitude when i say this we need to ask ourselves can we make a significant change in we use diagnose fractures or neglected trauma when we see at a tertiary center over here we see a lot of neglected elbow trauma coming from periphery which could have been treated with a simple intervention of a relocation but the patient comes to us one year one and a half year later so whether the available resources and the available ai can help us touch those lives prevent that morbidity this was the question which we were working on so all that puzzled mind and all those confusion richard fenman came to my help so i read him he says that we need to study hard what interests you in the most undisciplined irreverent and original manner so i started reading whatever was available on the net and that gave us an idea or that gave me an idea or a channel path and i had the opportunity having wonderful guides in terms of shivasta sir and deshpande sir and sauji sir went ahead and applied for my phd and got my phd in artificial intelligence in orthopedic surgery and we were able to solve the problem to some extent okay some extent so there was i was very jubilant when i was uh, aware that okay but that was just a piece of the puzzle in my hand the entire thing was just remaining so that made me or that pushed me on a way that we need to integrate we need to assemble these thought leaders or innovators at our place and need to make a opinion or rather a pathway for the future where we can develop these ideas these data pipelines indigenously so as again told at my start of my talk this is work in progress as it has become reiterative through the course of the talks that human beings can do that ai can do but we just cannot do it at the scale okay our cognitive capabilities are very limited to answer the immense load we need some kind of assistance we need some kind of a deciphering model which will make 
that data easy for us to make those predictions this is andrew engine he has compared artificial intelligence to electricity like electricity the invention of electricity or not invention the discovery of electricity made life very much easier for each and every one of us on this planet earth same is with the advent or the usage of ai because ai deep learning or machine learning is going to touch each and every aspect of our lives if we agree or not this is just a nutshell of what uh, our progress has been in the med medicine faculty in 1948 was the first time a randomized control trial was done in the world at that time the involved participants were not even aware that they were part of the study which is not at all possible today if you look at this timeline very closely you will note that this is a pointer yeah you will note that with every advance in physics or basic uh, uh principal branch like stemi we call it there has always been a progress in medicine like with the launch of that apollo 11 mission there was availability of computer tomography around 1984 there was launch of this magnetic resonance imaging and these inventors discoverers they were not from the medical background all medicine all research that has happened technologically has been translational research so i would say that we are sitting at a threshold we are we are looking towards a huge 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 uplift in this translational research and we need to make the most of it because in india we are 1.2 more than 1.2 billion people we have huge amount of data we can be pioneers in this data mining data uh, segmentation and uh, uh, refining industry and i don't see that why we are not the pioneers i mean it was a open channel challenge by sam altman at a huge conference in delhi where he said that india cannot do it so what do we know till now where where we are exactly in terms of the hyper cycle hype cycle in terms of ai right now as per 2023 november in terms of augmented reality in surgery health chat bots telemedicine bots referral center design this has been reiterated by uh, mr sachin rati in his particular uh, lecture so here we are and all the other technologies are going to lay take lot of time but the growth in terms of artificial the under, the interesting understanding which i have gathered from this is that the growth in terms of ai or machine learning doesn't happen in a linear way it is more of a three dimensional so can you imagine this graph in a three dimensional way apart from the connections between this linear graph of the dots over here there are interconnections also so augmented reality cat could add, uh, actually be connecting with personal genomic services okay so that kind of a connection can be happening but at the same time we need to understand how large long language models have uh, uh, progressed so it was last november when chat gpt was a accidental launch on the world platform and now it is the fastest growing company in terms of 100 million users as we have seen through the day how chat gpt has found its application in terms of education uh, telemedicine understanding a uh, uh, text and with the imperative networking as long as 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 fast as chat gpt is getting interlinked with other add-ons it is increasing its analytical and predictive skills so as i spoke to you before even the world leaders are concerned about it the way because they see the control shifting from them to us okay so there was a safety summit which was conducted and hosted by uk in 2023 and even the biden uh, biden administration has issued regulatory warnings about the usage of artificial intelligence for in human capacity so next slide this this is a graph i know uh, this looks like a busy slide but we need to understand since 1990 with the advent of it everything is getting more and more interconnected okay as you see these were all segregated sec sectors and now as the connections as the data flow through these connections or these uh, siloed segments become more and more there is a increase called as principant or a, if you are more connected you are more uh, celebrated and we are definitely on a traditional or a collusion course with uh, industries which are going to be 
digitize and if we keep on following our normal old ways we are there uh, we are uh, i mean definitely headed towards oblivion so just to put in a context more and more doctors will become a part of a ecosystem his role will be limited in a management application it will be the insurers the pharmacy the patient the researchers and these connections they will matter later on so we need to understand are we going to lead uh, this data or knowledge uh, revolution or we are going to be uh, left behind so there is one single takeaway from this me lecture or meeting if you can take it that instead of working in this siloed style uh, environment where we are working in our own universe and not uh, trying to uh, how can i say integrate in the ecosystem what covid has taught us we need to break these data silos in healthcare and we need to connect or rather have piloting effort towards making it into a integrated system so that we can make it a good analytical and predictive model so why this cme this cme is an effort or a effort to integrate into one conference because we need to deal or understand or discuss this problem on a common platform and come up with a integrated solution so what exactly is dmhr imac it's a interdisciplinary international multidisciplinary medical education conference and expo we hope that by the time next year we will have substantial amount of research and work done in a 365 days so that we can come up with something uh, of importance so there are certainly roadblocks as of now these are the day to day examples in which ai is being used now medical grade ai radiology is out fda has approved it there are 700 medical grade devices which have been approved but the uh, how can i say the leg legal regulations are since 1976 they have not been upgraded so we are working on a platform of 50 year old technology and there is a lot of outcry by these technological leaders as to change it so how can we deal with it we can prepare we can ask ourselves these questions and this platform is meant to do that this platform is meant for you to come up to us with questions and let us sit together and discuss and come out of with solutions which we don't know right now the way we are trying to do it this is just example someone sitting in the room my guides they provided me with the resources and the needs so how i can able to solve the uh, issue with distal radius fractures again this can help us decrease the long learning curves which are required because surgeons are not born or into incubators they have to be taught they have to uh, we have to make them learn and this can help us improve the way it helped me improve the life of this person was going to be very important Okay, I'm happy. So the takeaway is that there is no utopia or dystopia of health. We need to get out of that siloed, siloed healthcare and need to explore. And lateral thinking in terms of this will help. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, sir, for the wonderful talk. Uh, moving ahead, uh, we all know that healthcare is a field where skill development is of utmost value and importance. Uh, be it technical skills related to one's own specialty managerial skills public relations and speaking organizational skills and the list goes on there cannot be any growth without keeping oneself up to date which is why i, I think uh, dmihr believes in learning and leading uh, i now invite ms prashasti rastogi who is the director coursera for campus to speak on skills development in healthcare uh, ms rastogi will be joining us online uh please welcome her with a huge round of applause thank you so much thank you for uh, welcoming me to this forum very delighted to be here uh and meet you all this is one of those rare opportunities where sweatshirts meet the scrubs uh so happy to be here uh 
I was just listening very intently to the talk that uh, Dr. Asha was giving. And I think this is a great segue to, he left on a note that while there are so many applications where AI can complement doctors, how do you acquire and gain the knowledge is something that I'll talk about today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I thank Dr. Sandeep and his team uh, to provide this forum to me to talk about uh, how to acquire knowledge about artificial intelligence in the healthcare landscape. We are standing very much at the precipice of this revolution. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity that Tata Mege is taking to acknowledge its potential uh, and adopt it as well. A couple of weeks ago, I came to uh, know about a health firm in India, which is called Forest, Forest Health. And they've made some significant dent in diagnosis. Um, they are using AI algorithms to diagnose diabetic retinopathy, and the accuracy they claim is about 96%. This is just a very simple example of how AI has made a tangible difference in complementing doctors um, and saving lives of hundreds and, uh, hundreds and thousands of patients worldwide. This is what a traditional AI is doing which means based on existing data, analyze and complement diag uh, diagnosis. There's another revolution that is underway right now, which is generative AI. Generative AI has seen, uh, I mean, we don't have enough proof, but what we are hearing is personalized medicine or medicine espresso machines will be a reality soon. Drug discovery applications are already underway. Significant trials uh, to um, check whether time and cost of bringing new drugs to the market can be reduced. Some of the other possibilities I heard in the recent discussions was enhanced diagnostics and imaging, creating virtual assistance and mental health support. I mean, there are so many ways to embrace AI. What I'm going to talk today, and I'll shortly share my screen, is how Coursera, as an online learning platform, enables access to these skills uh, to healthcare professionals worldwide uh, to learn and develop uh, intelligence in these areas and also find applications and participate in this revolution. Just allow me to share my screen. I hope my screen is visible. Yeah, now I can see that it's there on the screen. Great. Uh, so I'm Prashasti Restoki. Um, as Dr. Aditya just introduced, I'm the director for Coursera for Campus. Coursera for Campus also works together with Tata Mege um, Institute to bring a lot of skilling opportunities to students uh, and professionals working here. Uh, we've seen that the global demand for healthcare workers is growing. I mean, this is a WHO data that talks about a shortage of 18 million health workers by 2030. And the prime reason for this is the limited capacity of health education programs. Um, your institution has obviously given us the opportunity to talk about not only the health education programs, but also going ahead and bringing new skills which are required for future healthcare professionals. Uh, there are a couple of trends driving the job growth in the Indian health sector. And uh, according to the National Health Mission and Niti Aayog, there are about 12 million jobs that are going to be added in the healthcare sector by 2030. Interesting to note is most of these are in care support roles, which will require intensive technology uh, support and intervention to maximize potential. Some of the areas highlighted by Niti Aayog, which are impacting the job growth in the Indian health sector, are digitalization. So they surveyed healthcare executives, and 81% of them said that the pace of digital transformation for their organization is accelerating and they need catching up. Two 
significant and powerful trends in the area of healthcare, which require retooling and reskilling our telemedicine and AI powered diagnostics. Dr. Ashe was talking about how um, AI has come in into medical lab technology as well and significantly increasing the data accuracy. Second, obviously, is government uh, framework programs like Ayushman Bharat, which are uh, promoting awareness about healthcare and uh, growing the infrastructure. Third one is demographic shifts. India uh, has now increasing disposable income. People are more conscious. There's more health awareness. And obviously, um, there's also a significant aging population, which will requires retooling of healthcare systems. And geriatric care is becoming a reality. Now, with all this happening, we see that there's a huge potential for growth and uh, there is a lot that can be done. But this lot also requires new skills. Here's a um, study by Bloomberg, which talked about automation, the fourth industri industrial revolution and how it's displaced a lot of jobs, which were lower order skills and more mechanical in nature. Um, there's something that happened with automation. People started gaining digital skills, increasing their knowledge, gaining credentials, and started moving towards the less vulnerable, high wage jobs, which require higher order skills, something like IT managers, financial managers, uh, coders, programmers, etc. There's something else that happened. So January 2023, generative AI became mass market. 12 million people latched onto the platform in the first four weeks of the launch of technology, and it has created another threat. So 49% of our workforce could have half or more of their tasks exposed to large language models. Um, this is labor market data from University of Pennsylvania in March. But what does that imply? It implies that a lot of healthcare professionals will, instead of human assistance, uh, will have to rely on technology. So uh, adaptability towards this technology becomes significantly important. This was the bad news. There's some good news. And the good news is, uh, Dr. Ashe, thank you for quoting our founder, uh, Andrew, Dr. Andrew Ng. Uh, I'll pick up a quote from one of the courses that he developed for Coursera, which is AI in healthcare. And he says, the world will just be better if AI is helping us. It will reduce the cost of goods, giving us good education, changing the way we run hospitals and the healthcare system. There's just a long list of things. Um, AI is everywhere because AI is now electricity. You may not know how it works, but you know how to use it. This also brings in uh, a different skill set that medical professionals are being asked to develop. Some of the soft skills are pretty obvious, critical thinking, teamwork, strong communication, interpersonal skills, compassion, empathy. But there are two new boxes that have been added to this graph. This is adaptability to technological advancements, how dexterous you are in bring, uh, using technology in your environment of diagnosis and surgery. The other one is understanding of data analysis and digital tools using AI and generative AI. And there are specific technology-driven roles. If you see the chart on the right, talks about where uh, new jobs are being created within the healthcare ecosystem of data analysts, cybersecurity specialists for data privacy, AI engineers, robotic technicians, medical lab technicians, tomorrow will also need an understanding of robotics uh, and healthcare informaticians to improve diagnosis accuracy. Now with this changing environment, how can Coursera step in to help professionals like you gain skills in emerging technologies. What I'm showing on screen are various areas in which Coursera has courses. 
because the theme of this conversation today is artificial intelligence, I've highlighted three courses which I would highly recommend uh, healthcare professionals in this room to consider enrolling and taking up. One is AI for medical diagnosis. This is also by Dr. These courses are also by Dr. Andrew Ng. Uh, he's the he's also the founder of DeepLearning.ai, one of those organizations that are actively researching and developing intelligence in AI. Second one is AI for medical prognosis. Third one is AI for medical treatment. So these are three very interesting courses which will give you an idea of how you could leverage AI in your day-to-day -day lives. And apart from that, obviously, medical device innovation and IoT and sensors are a reality for surgical uh, environments. So this is something that I would highly recommend picking up as well. Uh, we are not limited to AI today. We are in the age of generative AI and uh, future belongs in the hands of generative AI. Coursera also has generative AI awareness programs. Um, there are foundation courses for you to just absorb and understand what is uh, generative AI and how you can uh, have introductory level understanding of the basics. Then there are courses which will give you an overview of AI um, and what is the economics of it, how, what is responsible AI, what are the ethical considerations, um, and what are the applications that already exist in our environment where we could use them. So this is something that I would also recommend uh, all of you to pick and choose what finds your interest and utilize these resources uh, to get a opportunity to apply AI in your everyday lives. With this, I know there is a lunch break planned right after this. I don't want to stand between, uh, you know, the food uh, that is waiting for all of you, but just leaving you with a food of thought. Uh, our mission at Coursera is to build a nationwide learning program uh, supporting the National Skill Development Mission because we want the best of data and AI to be a reality for this country. And we want it to be accessible, scalable, and effective in building skills for everybody uh, who comes across our platform and we are able to make a significant difference. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I hope I've been able to excite you to pick up some of these programs and build your own AI portfolio. Prashasti, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for joining us on such a short notice. Uh, we would definitely like you to be uh, our partners or rather our guide in what exactly we can go ahead or uh, be I mean, part of this or learn more or become more AI literate as you said it. And we are expecting that you will participate definitely in our uh, next event. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, so just before we break for lunch, I would like to remind all the students and the faculty members that we have a workshop on the use of LLM for postgraduate and medical research lined up in the afternoon session. Uh, so please stay with us till that time. It will be a very interesting workshop. That being said, we'll break for lunch now. Lunch is being served on the first floor of Sodexo Canteen and we'll break for 30 minutes. We'll start sharp after 30 minutes. Thank you.
गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन सो नाउ विल बी स्टार्टिंग विद द थर्ड सेशन एंड द मोस्ट इंटरेस्टिंग वन वेर देर विल बी फोकस ऑन द इमर्जिंग ट्रेंड्स एंड वॉट एग्जैक्टली वी नीड टू एक्सपेक्ट इन द नियर फ्यूचर इन टर्म्स ऑफ रिजनरेटिव मेडिसिन सिमुलेशन एंड रिगार्डिंग डेटा सेफ्टी एंड वी विल हैव बी वी विल हैव अवर फैंटास्टिक गेस्ट फ्रॉम यू एई विल बी लॉगिंग इन सो आफ्टर दिस डॉक्टर तेजस वुड यू काइंडली इंट्रोड्यूस डॉक्टर संदीप वेलकम बैक एवरी वन Welcome back, everyone. I hope you have refreshed yourself with some good lunch. Um, we'll be starting the afternoon session in five minutes, so just bear with us for some time. So, next up, I would like to invite Dr. Vakar Nakvi. He's a he's a faculty of physiotherapy from the College of Health Sciences, Gulf Medical University, Ajman, UAE, and he'll be joining us online. And uh, I invite him to speak on the ethical role of AI in research. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Hello, Dr. Bakar. Uh, you can hear us, right? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me, Dr. Akshay? Akshay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for giving me such opportunity. And already, like, I feel most of the topics has been already covered. And I was thinking, like, which part have I have to cover? So I just I am trying to uh, uh, put up my ten minutes into uh, some of the components I feel which are very much important. when it comes to you know ai and everyone is using and talking about i been into this from like the last couple of years into more into the how we are using it uh, especially in uh, terms of medical education research in all the domains so uh, we have already talked a lot like i really like the way neeraj sir already mentioned a lot of thing aditi ma'am has mentioned all the things but uh, i trying to simplify what are the core essence of ai and how we are going to actually use it so most of people have already put up this thing like how we are going to go into the generative way how we are going to uh, feed up all the data sets and all and how we are going to get the answer there are a lot of things which has been talked about like even uh, we had a very good presentation about chat gpt which is based on open ai but there are other uh, Uh, LLM also, which exists like Google Bard and IBM Watson. So, the one thing I would like to convey, if I have not been conveyed till now, is uh, most of the data sets or the information what we are actually using now is up limited up to ninth of uh, sorry, it's a uh, valid up to ninth of uh, sorry, it valid up to September two thousand two one. It's not in real time. but most of uh, these uh, uh, organizations are working uh, hard to make it real time so most of the people who are using any type of ai these days either like chat gpt or google bard ibm watson or different thing we should understand one of the important part here like this the information whatever we are getting it's not real time that is one of the core aspect it is up to 2021 only and some of the uh, Uh, organization has updated into till january but it is not for that so main what i see um, these technologies they are not actually the replacement for us but it actually augment our work if we take these thing as assistant it helps a lot for our qualitative work rather than just you know focusing on that 
so i am mainly focusing on two things here like as even neera sir said in to the earlier talks about prompts and i'll just highlight in couple of minutes what are the good tools we can use the easy one uh, especially when it comes to the research and all so when it comes to the prompt a uh, lot of people are uh, a lot of almost all people into our health sciences medical sciences are using uh, chat gpt mainly and because it is one of the pioneer in uh, open learning platform in ai and all but still we are not understanding how the prompt uh, works very well with that these are all the data sets the chat gpt is a data set from variety of the websites even they are covering pubmed and everything so you know with the time we give them a proper prompt uh, we always just try to give them single prompt and expect the answer actually it does not work like that into the data set because even as aditi ma'am said about the natural language processing the most important thing is to chat with these thing we have to talk with them we have to train them to get the extract answer we need to have a clarity we might think whatever command we have written it is right and it is going to fetch us the clear and uh, clear and concise answer but most of the time now because this is the early developing time of uh, this command prompts and this chat gpt though so the things get very much you know a bit of skeptical when the commands are not, not clear it is not concise we have to talk with it this is the main crisp of uh, my prompts thing we have to chat we have to ask a lot i am just putting up one single example of a good com uh, command or a prompt you say like the part of prompt engineering when we you can even try this on your own when you are writing just to a chat gpt or any other llm engine uh, kindly give me some scientific uh, literature evidence for this it will give you answers but it won't be concise much here the the main important kick is you have to tell either you are using chat gpt or another bard or any other uh, llm you have to train them i have put up an example here like you have to tell that chat gpt you are a professor in orthopedics who are, who is specialist in acl surgeries you have more than 100 plus publications and pubmed we have to build up a character in chat gpt first if you really want a precise concise and much more better answer then you have to go with the second para you have to put up i need a help your help uh to search for recent peer reviewed articles and academic paper here you have to talk you have to give a command and in the third one you have to put up what exactly you need what included things you need into that so that you can generate the actual concise result here in afterwards when you get an answer you can ask it directly so what people are expecting from chat gpt nowadays most of the people who are just came into these platform they ask a single line question and they expect the answer to be precise it does it won't work very well with the conciseness of the answer rather than first we need to build up a character we have to tell the chat gpt or whatever platform we are using like what actually we are expecting if we try this method of you know three or four chat uh, to and fro method you will see the results are actually excellent it is much more precise than what we can expect here i am going to just precisely mention about some of the good tools especially when it comes to uh, the medical research because chat gpt is a bit of vague even you can ask them how to cook uh, masala rice so they can answer it but these tool which i am mentioning now is uh, i feel like very much important in every aspect of research rather than searching for the scientific literature from chat gpt if i am talking about the scientific literature i'll use perplexity the perplexity they are much more filtered and they are more focused toward the scientific uh, articles and all in chat gpt there was a problem still persist which deals with the generation of the fake citation sometimes you know it can even make up uh, some sort of your results if you are asking something they might even show you this treatment or this surgery is effective in this but sometimes it is made up it is much not much more clear but if we use perplexity it is also free and payment mode it is also using some of the search engines uh, from chat gpt llm and all but i feel like perplexity is having much more precise lit maps is excellent tool when it comes to the literature review so here in the tools i am highlighting like which part of the research like which tools you can use rather than you know putting up uh, all the together bulk at one 
there are tools which are having speciality of different different way they can assist us lit map is basically uh, it works very well with the scientific uh, you know uh, uh, i can say like the scientific literatures and the review of literatures we can get the third is uh, sky space and sky even this is very much helpful for us uh, for you know uh, getting the research grade or the research synthesis if we are really want to first let go step by step if we are starting with perplexity we are trying to generate uh, the recent you know you want to have a small sort of proposal or you want to see the research gap we can start with the perplexity you can put those article into lit map to see like what is the way this research is going on from where to where it came so that you can actually have the hierarchy into the ascending or descending way sky space and sky site are very much helpful for making the research gate research ecosystem and if you integrate everything into paper pal uh, there was a time people used to um, use uh, grammarly or quillboard they are also very much vague but paper pal is exceptional it is very much exceptional when it comes to the writing uh, so whenever you, you are writing anything even if you are taking from chat gpt or perplexity you can paste that thing into paper pal and you can see the way it actually correct uh the language and the grammar into the scientific writing here the main word for paper pal is the scientific writing so it assist a lot it even can assist you in generating the titles of the research it also assist in generating uh the abstract of the uh, of your paper so if you use these tools wisely like you should know perplexity is for what lit map is for what there are ma many other tools which has been already described like pdf uh, dot ai there is research gpt also which is a embedded plugin in chat gpt so there are lot of things to do into us but the thing is like if you uh, see how these thing ethically or morally or the data sets are are working now uh, for us and the way they are helpful for us stanford are working so hard on this biomed lm which is the exclusive data set from pubmed so for me or for our health profession or medical profession the most core important data set is biomed lm and we are still working to fine tune it fine tune uh, like to make the answers much more precise the main core and even what asha sir asked uh, into some uh, uh, presentation before how we can contribute for us we should actually start not only working on using those llm and these tool rather than you know implementing them and even we can make our own models and these are mostly the open sources so i really feel this there this is a perfect time to learn about these llm and how we can even use this biomed lm which is one of the best medical data set from pubmed which has already cleared usmle exam and there are a lot of opportunities the same model can be implemented for orthopedics for the gynecology for the medicine for the surgery for the physiotherapy for the dental for everyone so there are a lot of opportunities when we are working with the language learning module so this is it i won't take much time because i think it's already being delayed for the conference thank you any any questions i'm here to answer thanks a lot thanks a lot dr vakar uh I mean, it is a pleasure, of course, always to interact with you since our days in NKP, and I know that you are a hardcore scientist. Uh, just one question: How far uh, integrated? I mean, uh, what is your approach, or rather, are there any directives which you give to your students whenever they are using their generative uh, AI uh, thing while writing any research paper? yeah the thing is uh, uh, dr ashish sir the pe people like that i said into the second slide like the augmentation what people expect to ask the question directly and just get the answers actually that is not uh, uh, a complete way of writing any assignments or giving any answer for, for the students rather than we have to put up our own words first and we should take these thing as augmentation to help us writing like we can write our content first and we have to ask the chat gpt can you make it much more scientific as a edit letter of editor or as a assignment which i want to submit it for it so there are ethical consideration and even icmje has already mentioned like even in the manuscript we need to mention clearly like if you have taken any help of ai and all so still this uh part of uh, the ai and the medical education research is having a, a bit of conflict but i think with the time once we have 
the clarity of everything into that it will work very well into synchronous manner any other question so one last question just if i have to use two bots or two uh, llm models for uh, writing anything which one would you suggest just yeah dr aisha yesterday only i was uh, reading some papers on that and many of the exceptional researchers like you into other countries what they are doing they are putting 10 10 questions into both the llm even 3 llm and checking the accuracy it's not like which is best now it's like what we need to check which is best according to our dire need we need to put up like i have seen some papers in jama yesterday they have tried the vignette and the questions on the chat gpt on galactica on bio nlm and they see which is more accurate for their domain because these data sets are still into the fine fine tuning stage plus they are not in real time that is one of the two constraint we are facing now so we need to test ourselves depending our specialty and our question like which of the data sets are giving much more precise information and i feel yesterday when i was reading about these papers into different specialty even ent people they have checked 10 questions like into different different uh, you know the data sets and llm and they found out this llm is best for them so it is a time actually for a good research where we can actually indulge ourselves and even we can generate good papers it is actually an opportunity it is not a question thanks a lot so basically like uh, antagonistic llm working against each other and generating good data so i like all uh, have different data sets i still feel like we we are we should actually start working on biomet llm and we should develop our own uh, you know softwares and the things um, it, will, it will be much more precise than the other llm because they are more focused toward the other domains we are focused toward the medical domain thank you thank you dr vakar we are so so uh, so happy that you could join us online and next time thank i you. hope you will be thank here you. in person thank you thank you for joining thank you sir thank you lot thank you thank you so much sir so in the next couple of lectures we will have a look at the emerging trends and concepts in the field of ai itself as well as the trends in its application in different fields across healthcare first up we have the director of dmi hr global and an eminent orthopedic surgeon dr sandeep shrivastava sir speaking on the emerging trends in regenerative medicine and ai uh, please welcome sir with a huge round of applause very good afternoon aur khane ke baad matlab bilkul hyperglycemic ke state mein <laughs> would just like to say we are being watched all over the world i mean i have getting comments from south Af- uh, south korea also they are okay. they are just watching us live so they are very much interested in your talk absolutely fantastic so thank you so much for inviting us and i think so it has to be a curtain raiser and what uh, we are expecting in the main conference later on after a year there are few things which are unique to this particular event one is in the history of our own university we never had a curtain raiser event so this is the first curtain raiser event and this is just to tell you that uh, how much uh, we should be able to raise the level of your thirst so that you are ready for that big bottle which comes next right and the whole conference is though on emerging trends of which ai is one of the biggest emerging trend in healthcare recently but then there are other trends also like regenerative medicine so it will be interesting to look and peep into both the aspects that what these uh, simulations so regenerative medicines how these are shaping our healthcare and where does the ai can play a role in it so my talk is into two parts one is like uh, what is regenerative medicine and second is does we have a ai shaping its role so first comes first what is regenerative medicine regenerative medicine as a whole is like all about building what ai also everybody said from the morning for a precision medicine it's all about how we develop a medicine which is very precise which is very safe and targeted towards targeted outcomes so what we want that only happens no side effects nothing else happens so that is that is whole quest for all development of particularly getting technology into into it the adaptive technology the ai the regenerative care everything and if you look back 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 then yes we all looking trying to build what we are trying to do right now building the future of healthcare so what regenerative medicine offers particularly it offers medical cellular transplantations one thing so we are we are when you are talking of regenerative medicine we are thinking cell cellular mechanisms 
we are thinking of tissue engineering building a world out of those cells into the tissues and how to engineer and repair the defects in our bodies how to overgo the disease aspects we are thinking of 3d bioprintings we are thinking of gene therapies and thinking along with development of robotic engineering uh, and nanotherapy as well and everything has got a link of artificial intelligence into it how far human will think there is a limitation to it and uh, what has brought me into ai interesting is a very very good read which said 100 years back when there was industrial revolution maybe 200 years back what was the main key crux of us everybody was even afraid of sitting inside the car so you you see those videos so there is a car going and people are ready to sit on it they were afraid of it and what happened now if i have to go delhi i just take a flight and go i don't even blink so that is the magic of industrial revolution same is going to the magic of intelligence so one human mind versus thousand human minds it will be different world so we should not feel any threat about taking ai into our healthcare systems rather it is more of a question of how and when answer is simple how is like right now when right now is it safe you do not know what is safe nothing is safe right now only thing is the same understanding has to get built up in the mindset of regulators also because you know red tapeism though we try to avoid those terms but that is the biggest hassle when i try to practice this also and their concern is equally well taken because they are concerned with the wellness of the whole society so they they need to see that nobody digs into your pockets of everyone in the name of something which is which may which may work limitedly so their concern is also well taken but that is that is what is so till you don't start utilizing it every day every way i think so we will not build enough evidence to tell those regulators now you ease up one of the responsibilities as a doctors as a medics is to adopt it and start using it whatever and whenever you get a chance the same is true for regenerative medicine also so why regenerative medicines for simple reasons it is the source which can build solutions to current beyond current problems so let us take an example of a cancer so do you think like we have sort of a had a transformative cancer care till now a little bit a little bit only so maybe breast cancer maybe few more we can say like blood cancers you can say yes i can cure them out of this problems rest of it nothing much is coming but regenerative medicine we all know has a huge potential to do reverse the whole thing so problems which are as big as that to problems which can help you to go in a better healings are all there lifestyle diseases metabolic syndromes we don't have a solutions so once i am diabetic i am diabetic forever but now i am looking at regenerative medicine with a lot of hope the stem cells may cure me so i am hypertensive i am hypertensive forever similarly autoimmune genetic link diseases for a orthopedic surgeon it simply translates into equal to rheumatoid arthritis most of the times and do i have a answer no sickling sickling we all know is the uh, recessive gene disease base disease so that's the easiest to crack as far as gene therapy goes so we have we have opportunity over there medical cell transplantation means biological synthetic materials to repair damaged tissue so it's like now both the things are there biological as well as synthetic materials but working at a cellular levels eliciting molecular responses that is how they work and how what are those means they can be cellular therapies simple as simple as platelets supernatant uh, concentrates stem cells currently there are more than 100 cells which have got a therapeutic potential so you you take it as a other way your own body is ready to heal yourself it's just the pathways we need to define you want to know what will heal what so there are exosomes there are uh, platelets there are stem cells mesenchymal cells which will heal most of the diseases but the equation is slightly complex and it is where we need a deep thinking and it is where we need to have a deep learning and that is where we need the artificial intelligence so it's a complex procedure to collect 
to cultivate them, to purify them, to isolate them, then expand the cells in millions from one cell or two cells or hundred cells, and then put it back for therapeutic use. So everywhere artificial intelligence can be a, a hope for us. The stem cells we all know, there are different types of stem cells. We'll not talk about embryonic stem cells. It's like a, a red card in the field of football. If you utter in the stem cell conference embryogenic, everybody says that's not done. But that is the most potential one. So we all know that player who is shown the red card is the most potential one who can <laughs> affect the results, but he cannot play. Same is true for embryogenic cells. We cannot use embryogenic cells, right? For the reason that uh, it has it brings up a huge threat of a lot of things which can go, which are not legally controlled. So it's a different fetuses and there may be forced abortions, use of fetus tissue and all those things. So nobody will allow it. Adult stem cells. Limitation is they are not as good as embryogenic stem cells. So what is the way out? People have developed induced potential, induced uh, pluripotent stem cells. So adult cells which will behave like embryogenic cells, iPSCs. That is the way out. And a person got the Nobel Prize for it. We all know those in 2006. For doing this. So these are the most, and if you look at the stem cells, these are the most promising ones right now. And we are trying to develop now the tissue specific stem cells. That is the best one. Mesenchymal cells. So these are the common sources. We all know bone marrow, umbilical cord, adipose tissues. And then we are using it for both the things. Differentiating it into the major tissue to help to repair the things. And not only this, it is also being used for immunomodulate the environment. It's a very important function. So you have cells which are with low pro-inflammatory options and high pro-inflammatory options. So now we have to see the world is how the world is changing. From the world of anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, we are working towards pro-inflammations. Good inflammation will heal you. So that is, that is what we are trying to develop to regenerative medicines. Transfer uh, MSCs, we all know. Bone marrow transplantation has become a way of curing so many blood cancers. It's approved. Others are still like into clinical trials. And now almost it is said that more than 10,000 patients are currently undergoing clinical trials, undergoing cellular stem cell therapies in different, uh, for different diseases across the world. So we have huge hope coming up that if this succeeds, then probably those complex solutions for uh, those complex problems will be available. But then again, the same thing. We are still into clinical trial phase one or two. It's a long way to go without the help of AI. Uh, just, just a word, I mean, like, have you seen the movie Can Vaccine War? You have all seen it, right? So it's about India developing the COVID shield vaccine. How ICMR helped it out. So how quickly it has come in nine months. So the whole analysis is based by AI. And not only India, the world over, the vaccine could be developed because of COVID and during COVID because of all these decisions which are critically analyzed by deep learnings. And they are not tested on animals anymore. They are tested on certain other platforms which are technological platforms. So that, that's the advantage of AI getting into and vaccine world is a part of regenerative medicine. We all know this. These are different trials which are going for such a complex problems. You can see this. So maybe very soon we'll have in market the therapies available just five years down the line. Tissue engineering. The tissue engineering, particularly biomaterials, cells and signals. It's all about all these three things getting combined into creating an environment which can be used. So today we are not talking of regenerative medicine mainly, we are talking of AI. So I will just skip just to introduce that it's a very important way of having a functional replacement. And we'll just give you a quick glance how far the tissue engineering has gone, right? So you look at this. First successful kidney organite is already taken place in Harvard. So they are not putting children to dialysis anymore. They are using kidney organ. Organite means it's not exactly the organ, but organ-like. It has all functional property. It's like a tray with all functional property, which can clean your blood. 
so they have gone so far this is the kidney organoid under electron microscope it's already there now it's a, it's a matter of time they start bioprinting it and having a kidney exactly like yours to put it in maybe 5 years this is very much possible so we are talking of tissue engineering leading to artificial organs the so organites as i said the problem with organites is they do not have vascular vessels so they built out of cells where vessels are lacking so people started having a vasculature and then putting up the organ cells pre printed and then we, we what we call as a organ on chip so either you can grow vessels into the organ to have a vascular organ or i can have a vascular tree and grow organ on it so it's like organ on chip because this vascular tree i can use it for any organ so now it's like concept is like on this so i grow a vessel vascular tree and put a organites on it they are made up of hydrogels mostly it is that is where we are now landing up or shaping up for regenerative medicine care so most of us will trans will later on become from uh, a, a surgery will shape up to give put up the Uh, microvascular surgeons to put up those organoids tissue into you, including the bone. So I may not be needed to put up an implant anymore. Bone is destroyed. Don't worry. I will replace your bone and put up it. So that's that's what it is shaping up. So we have both the uh, categories: emergent ones and top-down engineerings. So from below or from up. Both engineering technologies are there, and all these are AI is helping immensely in drug development. Somebody in the morning very much focusedly, I think so. uh from singapore sachin mr sachin elaborated on it how the drug development is shaping up under ai how it is making the things which would have taken 29 years to cut it down to 9 months i mean the same time in in which the human is like born that is that is fast how how it is happening up and these are like all organites you can see this is incubated brain it work functions it thinks people have been able to build up a incubated brain these are like only one single these slides are taken from howard stem cell study with their permission these are only from one lab what is happening around the world maybe a little bit more who knows lungs particularly covid this was the one research which was done very fast right so in the mouse they have a functional run and in human they have organite and now now for us for as a clinician responsibility will be how to use it right so the things are like and this is where the artificial intelligence will synchronize us with these developments and 3d bioprinting this is also coming up very nicely and we have a lab in vardha which have which is a pretty good 3d printing lab not bio printing exactly but yes these days i mean like we are not far off from the point where we can print a organ in a lab with the help of injects extrusion based or laser assisted printers this is all happening so this is the process how it is printed so those material developments which will be used as the base that is extracellular matrix is developed in the labs but the rest is done with the help of technology so ai us and technology i think so this is a breakthrough things which is happening which is which will transform the whole healthcare this triangulation and it is why the ai is playing an important role in our researches so not only in making reviewing the researches as was being discussed previously in developing the research part also it is like taking helping us in making a major correct decisions so bone formation is like one thing which is happening very fast even in our labs with the help of iit mumbai we have a project see when we do neurosurgery there was neurosurgeon over here when we do neurosurgery we take out the bone and like keep it inside somewhere and then after some time we put it back so now they are not doing it like this so they have built up a print a bone 
and that printed bone is immediately transplanted so exact defect is printed so you have a nose which is shattered so i can print a nose and put it there and grow a skin over it so this this orbits high cheeks i mean it's a sign of uh, beauty so if somebody has got depressed one they can get a replaced one and we can get it printed in our labs right skin models i said so we all know those experiments where a 3d printed a, a ear external pinna was put under the arm and the skin was grown and then it was put back so this is possibility now with the help of regenerative medicine this is all is happening human heart models for precision medicine and drugs so what how where it is being used you see right now it may not be used for clinical uh, treatments but it is being used to test the drugs so i don't need to take it take the drug on animals anymore i can do it on a lab dish where the human heart is there so i can see the, what is happening with a new drug so we have we have uh, dr mukund charagade as our uh, intentional faculty of eminence we have developed the liver enzymatic liver so i don't need to test the drug on animal models you can just run it through the lab into the enzymatic livers different enzymes and we know what is going to happen gene therapy then another aspect of this is like gene therapy we all know uh, gene therapy works like it is both either you modify or manipulate both the things can be done so how do we do is like three ways uh, either you replace the gene which is defective or inactivate the gene which is working badly particularly in cancers or you can introduce a new modified gene so it starts working particularly in congenital defects so all those three ways gene therapy can be done so we have we have uh, uh you both the things can be it can be done in the labs and then inserted into the body or it can be developed in the body also but if you do it in the lab which is the commonest way you need to put it inside the body and for that you need something to vectors and the common vector is viral so other vectors also being developed but the commonest right now is viral so virus is a good thing for most of us till covid happened it's a gold standard in the virus immune suppressed you know virus so we can make it modify the mrna uh, sorry modify the gene put it on mrna of a virus and send it to your body and it will deliver to the part and these are like the other vectors which are being used the current trend crispr technology again the person got from the uk got the nobel prize for this so you do not replace the whole gene but you can replace it only cut and replace that defect it is not it has not happened i'm sure like many of you are youngsters you know gene is nothing but a chromosome and chromosomes are nothing but made up of four proteins in a arranged in a particular mode and manner it's a huge data these four things when they arrange themselves it the data the genome project human human genome project again it won the nobel prize Where, how they could analyze those data it was only with the help of artificial intelligence not a generated artificial intelligence as prashasti was saying we should stop saying ai any anymore it's like auto generation so once a square it is put in the square root again square root again square root and again square root yesterday i will i'll quote a small incident yesterday it was it happened very interesting thing so i wanted a passport size photograph for a visa so she said she took a photo she took a one photo and she pasted it on a paper and i said my god she is going to post it 16 times no so she pasted one and then made it two 2 to 4 4 to 6 and 6 to 8 and low it's ready so that is smartness is with the ai that generated so need not generate it like 1 2 plus 2 2 plus 2 4 and how much you want to go fast and that is how they do it very fast now these are the different gene therapies which are being developed and like tissue engineering giving a gene therapy is very simple one is like currently if only one gene is defective that is easy to do we all are in a area where sickling is so common and we all know sickling is a single recessive gene so it's easy to do but still it is not happening 
I'm sure like very soon we'll see gene therapy for sicklers coming up. Thalassemia already there. So uh, giving gene therapy is very simple. You consult, you uh, evaluate the eligibility. If he's eligible to take it, prepare, get it prepared in the labs. It may be UK, wherever you want. And then give it as IV therapy, that's it. And then follow it up. Only thing is cost. So we all know we, many of us contributed to that particular gene therapy where a small child of four year old had some muscular dystrophy and 16 CR was raised across India. Unfortunately, one may not be enough. So they may need a repeat of these injections. But it is developing. Day is coming when this will be common therapies. Very interestingly, regenerative medicine is also about anti-aging. So that's the most interesting part. Nobody wants to get old. Nobody wants to, I mean, we know this. Amar nahi bhi rahe. I mean, even if you don't die, we don't want to get old. We want to die young. Isn't it? Anti-aging is very much possible with the help of principles. If you follow what is evolving out of our learning, out of digital medicine. So both the things, if you are aging or not aging, that also can be monitored. So there's a lot of diagnostics which are going on. Biomarkers of aging. How old you really are, the damages which are happening to your DNA and proteins, the microenvironments of your bodies, ultimately under the skin, we all are same. So we have telomere, we can measure telomeres and we can know how old are you recovering or are you degenerating. Likewise, particularly, increased inflammation is the cause of degeneration. And these inflammations are triggered by a lot of micro injuries which are happening in your body, even after eating also and otherwise also. So food itself can be a cause of your degeneration. And if you practice as simple as what we call as a homotic stresses, you may be able to stop degeneration, if not trigger regeneration. So there is a famous experiment which is going on. Uh, we will not name those two persons where there is a Young, he, that particular person, he was 63 years old, has a young uh, boy of 22 years old and father and son are raising against the time. And father age is now 33 years. So he is trying to reverse his age through all those practices, which includes a lot of Ayurvedic practices such as yoga, amortic stresses, breathing exercises, cold showers, hot showers, and what not. So now he has come to, that son is 22 years and his telomere length shows 33 years. So he says he will go back and become younger than his son. So this lady is 114 years. So we have experimentally coming to the scientific things. You see the hypertrophic heart over here. They have been able to reverse the hypertrophy of the heart and put it back to the normalcy. Hypertrophic heart is a failure of right ventricular failure. I mean, people will die because of hypertrophy. It does not work equally well. So what does regenerative medicine is trending to emerge as? A lot of early prospects. Not only for repair and restoration of specific organ or tissue after chronic diseases or injuries, so finding out answers to those things which are unanswerable till now, including for cancer, including for genetic defects. Cancer biologics is one thing which I think so, which will become a common platform for AI and regenerative medicine to evolve a good solution, medicine to evolve a good solutions. It is fueling both the and including technology in corporations. It's fueling the most of the researches right now. And of course, gene therapy, including predictive diagnostics. So I, I'm sure like you all might be having some idea about predictive diagnosis. So I need not be diagnosed as a cancer patient to know if I can develop cancer. There is something which I can get tested to know if I will develop a cancer. So liquid biopsies is another way. Subclinically, we are able to diagnose it now. So predictive diagnosis is all based on very deep learning of not only one, one area, 
but multiple parts of your body molecular when we are saying parts is like cellular molecular parts so those analysis those trends then gets converted and they are compared with a trend or patient who is already having cancer and if that trends are matching right now we can know that this person may have cancer may not have cancer and we all know um, breast cancer war has been won because of this trend so they have been able to identify the high risk genes and they are able to give selectively some medications to prevent or slow down those for cancer but still regenerative medicine have got its own challenges which includes in a efficiency we do not know how much it will work so right now we are in the same area the same concerns where ai is we do not know a lot of things we know a bit of things so insufficient inefficiency lengthy complex processes why because there is a huge data which needs to be analyzed which a lab a single person a group of person inside the lab may not be able to do but yes many such labs coming together and merging with the help of artificial intelligence will be able to do so that is what is uh, a common trend which is emerging when we are learning about regenerative medicine artificial intelligence drug discovery development for predictive uh functioning is the one way cost effectiveness definitely again including what is the right protocols we do not know so those right protocols can also be now developed with the help of deep learning so that is what the role of uh, ai is helping not only in regenerative medicine but almost in all the areas of our working including accelerating drug development and discovery already vaccine example is there precision medicine so anti aging knowing what is going wrong particularly in your body a patient's body and not necessarily that the same is true for everybody it's very precise medicine drug deliveries which can happen image analysis and diagnostics this is one area i think so where uh, ashay did his phd so predictive diagnosis so when we think i am a professor of 30 years somebody is a resident of one year experience so we interpret the image with the help of ai with the same intensity so when i say it's a fracture he also says it's a fracture so there is no variability in our diagnosis otherwise he may miss it so that is that is what is happening hmm? predictive modeling for treatment outcomes so we do not know this treatment will finally land up where with the help of ai now we can say this will only be able to land up up till this point beyond this point we need to change our strategy we need to change our treatments this side effects will come up or this is just it will get blocked up particularly in diabetes etc where there is insulin resistance oral hypoglycemia does not work after some time all these things can be predicted so right now we can take care of those things technology adaptions somebody talked about technology also adaptions robotic assisted i don't know how many of uh, you have seen robotic surgery but as a surgeon it is such a big relief so when we do surgery we stand for 6 hours and do the surgery sweating taking uh, with us a heterologous team so somebody is in the operation theater working somebody is in the operation theater not working just standing hmm? so there are nurses there are uh, attendants all of varied learnings so that team heterogeneous team working for six hours together for the same outcome to keep them aligned for six hours is a huge task and that is that that heterogeneous environment when we work we know how much stressed out we get and as the reason we get a kick off when the surgery stops so they, they say you look very relaxed after surgery thing is like i relax after sleep also you never see me after sleep but that that it is just is just relieved with robotics i need not sit stand for 6 hours to do the surgery i need not tackle that heter heterogeneous team i can eat drink coffee and do the surgery my hand moves only this much but robotic hands moves 730 degrees so they can move like this i can see only from front robot can see from behind so i put a camera and start surgery from behind 
So those are the technological advan advantage when you adopt these things. So it's just like one sector of healthcare, which is just like maybe less than 20% surgical interventions. What about other sectors? It's, it's got a huge uh, implementation, I mean, scopes. All those things are evolving. We know uh, we are dependent on nursing staff for giving drugs regularly. So somebody, every time we write 8 a.m., every patient should take the drug 8 a.m. Is it possible humanly for her to go and give the same drug at 8 a.m. for 30 patients? And there is no like you know, addressing system also where I can stand and say, okay, now take your glass of water and take drug. All of you together now. Nobody does it like that. So she will go from one patient to another, another, another. By the time the last one, it's 9 a.m. But then with a the robot, probably this will be possible. So a lot of things which will be possible by uh, involvement of technology. And all those technology will work with the help of artificial intelligence only. So there is a huge scope of artificial intelligence into these things. So all those things accelerating the development just because of precise analysis of data. The same decision for a human mind takes a lot of time. And not only this, we only work for eight hours maximally in a day. We can leave artificial intelligence to work three times, 24 hours. So already if even he is equal to our mind, he is three times ahead of us. Those things are the big advantage of involving technology in our decision making. Precision medicine, if genome is known, side effects will be gone. Drugs can be precisely given. So nobody is 60 kg, but all doses are made for 60 kg. So I have been struggling, my weight becomes 58 kg. I have been struggling for last three months to make it back to 60 kg. So that at least I don't fall down my drug doses. But that is how you need to work otherwise. So there is no drug for 45 kg person precisely. Either you give a half tablet or you give a full tablet. So there is 450 milligram or there is a 225 milligram, there is nothing. But these things can evolve very precise deliveries of gross drugs. Precise outcomes. You can predict the outcomes and make it more precise, not only surgically, but medical outcomes also. Create platform for deep interactivity technology. Because uh, technology we need to adopt and we have already adopted. It's not a question of not adopting. It's a question of how much intensity we want to get into it now. So your library books are in the shelves since last, uh, how many times I have come, two years, five years, they are inside the shelf. People are on the Kindle, people are on the laptop, people are with the PDF. So they are already adopted technologies. We have adopted technologies in our lives. So if I, if I ask you, how many of you are uh, using generated AI in day-to-day -day life? Please raise your hands. One, two, a few. You don't realize it. How many of you use a email platforms? All of us. And how do you think like spam will get separated? By AI. Up, you open one spam mail for three days and automatically it will move into your inbox. Right? So that is the, everybody is using it. Most of the corporate secretaries, secretarial officers are using to generate uh, their replies through email. So now the replies which we receive is of a different English and different formats. So translations, already we are adopted it. So today we had a discussion in the lunch that to, there's an AI over here. And uh, so where do we stand and how do we put the AI into use? So sir said, we should start learning Python. I said, no, sir, I made this mistake. So when the computer came in 90s, I went and got admitted into NIT and said, please let me learn COBOL. 
and i learned this language for one year only to find out after 6 months i don't have any use to it and the language of computers have changed i should be standing at this end i should be knowing how to use it is spending my time and getting into conflict with those persons who are trained to do it as a healthcare we have to stand at this end and start using it into our day to day things you can raise generate a prescription for safety whatever it is right now how much safe it is it's a issue but if you generate one prescription every day finally it will get what you want at least you can design the whole formats you can you can get over into your language weaknesses so grammatically and uh, i mean you can go ahead with not everybody is good with english even we have our own failures in english so those things you can do you can generate replies you can we just had a discussion on how to use ai for researches so how many how many of you have ever made a paper out of ai only have you done this i don't think so like don't don't feel shy of it i have done many of it it's simple most important thing is it's not see what ai will do ai will let you know the answers so human mind needs to be trained for asking questions so as a teacher as a facilitator my duty is now to make them learn how to ask it right so when vehicles came it was not a question of not traveling in the vehicles it was a question of knowing where you want to go and the same thing you should know abhi navigation bhi aa gaya par navigation will not let you know where you want to go that answer where you want to go is yours the more precisely you want to know then the tools will come then the navigation comes and he tells this is the fastest route this is the costliest route and this is the crowded route now it is up to you what you enjoy so most of us will take crowded route because we want to waste time on the road which may not be true it all depends same is true in this also the question framing is the most important thing so i frame a question can i use prp in wounds right and then it gives a answer then i say what are the current evidences for pr using prp in wounds give me a bibliography as soon as i say bibliography it gives me a bibliography then i say give it me in a one cure method so it rewrites and before i blink my bibliography is ready and then i write say write introduction to this considering all this bibliography and he writes introduction to it then discussion then I, whatever crude observation i have i put it there and write ask them to say please put it in a table format and it does and then i go to the excel sheet and calculate it by automated calculations formulas and my whole thing is ready when 1 to 2 hours but then it is not ready for publication now i start reading it if it has done the things rightly or wrongly you know you cannot rely like that so before you buy a vehicle you need to test brakes you need to test its acceleration everything same is true over here the data which has it has put may not be fact it may be fictitious how many of you have a wiki wiki encyclopedia page you don't have it so like today go ahead and make it as i am such and such i am a president of this country i am good i am a olympic medal winner i am a swimmer who can swim 200 meters in 3 seconds all the stuff right whatever you think let it be there and just keep it opening for every day for maybe a month and after a few days you will find what as soon as i will write sandeep shivasto the google will say he is the president of this country he is a olympic medal winner and he is this and he is this and he is this is it true i am just good in lying nothing else and it will not say that unless until my other data is also available then somebody may say he is this way he looks like this and this way he looks like this he is lying same is true with this facts are different and fiction is different so if you give what was being discussed and what uh, aditi also said 
it's all about data inputs so if it is wrong everything is wrong so i think so that that is where we are in crossroads that is where the human matters even in education also so our roles are changing but for them to tell them this is fact and this is fictitious there has to be some human and probably we will be there hopefully so to summarize irm and ai that is regenerative medicine and artificial intelligence both are transforming forces right intersection of ai and regenerative medicine has opened quite a few avenues which are very interesting and we should i mean we should get motivated to get learn more and more about them we start you to using both of them as a concept as wherever it is definitely uh, engagement of ai ai can ensure few things if which are very um, sort of uh, it will, it will let, let the ambiguity take out being taken out of this and built a science which is based on logics the one thing which computer is not like is no logics it's all logical thing even the way the soft agar aap log software if you have any one of you have written a software you will uh, uh, like uh, realize it's all logic so you need to put it in that language diabetes there are two options this 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 if this happens then choose this then only the language works so all those things will help us to develop a very safe prompt and predictable outcomes is a huge potential for clinical care transformation as far as both the things goes both are emerging so there is a huge opportunity for us to get into it and enjoy that particularly it's like what we always say i always say in hindi so like your international audience is there but i would still like mention it tamasha na guske dekhne mein mujhe aaye dur se to kya mujhe aaye so i don't know how many of you have seen a very good movie first day first show first bench add that first bench also it's a different world enjoy yourself thank you so much thank you very much sir for that wonderful lecture uh, i would like to invite dr ashay kekatpure sir to felicitate dr sandeep shrivastava sir uh, with a small moment as a token of our appreciation i would also like to invite dr bankar sir to felicitate dr sandeep shrivastava sir thank you very much sir uh, so research research and development forms an integral part of the medical profession and there cannot be any growth in our field without research and development with ai growing growing faster than ever it has planted a seed in the field of r&d as well therefore we must make ourselves aware of how to use ai to our advantage in the field of research that being said with the amount of data and information which is accessible to these ai platforms and with the ability of some of these to store and link different aspects of the information together there are some serious ethical considerations and safety issues lingering around the field of ai this is especially important in healthcare where highly confidential information related to the patients doctors hospitals is at stake the next few talks will be focused on this and shed some more light on the same i invite dr nandakishor bankar the vice dean of research and development dmmc to speak on the use of llm in medical research and its ethical considerations please welcome sir with a huge round of applause so good afternoon so uh, everybody is worried about research and development uh, regarding their papers how to write their papers and all all things so basically my talk is uh, uh, what is the use of that uh, large language models in research and its ethical consideration so what is uh, llm so uh, it is a language model that leverage massive amount of data and it is having a complex architecture uh, it understand all this data and generate human like text okay jo hame chahiye hota hai ki human like text hona chahiye 
so what are the features the four features you already know all these features uh, the scale massive scale data both in terms of number of parameters and in the size of the training that data what it requires so uh, models like gpt uh, generative pre trained transformer it contains billions of parameters in it making them exceptionally complex and capable of capturing intricate patterns in language then what it requires it requires pre training and fine tuning so this is important fine tuning what we say and again after fine tuning what it requires is the human intervention okay so uh, two steps training is there uh, pre trained on diverse corpus of text uh, from internet grammar syntax contextual relationships etc and then it is fine tuned on specific tasks or domains allowing allowing them to specialize in particular applications such as medical research language translation code generation etc the third important point regarding llm is contextual understanding now these models uh, they consider the surrounding words like just sir said ki uh, what you require uh, regarding research means he will understand oh, what are your variables what are your parameters you want to put okay and then it will determine the meaning of that given words and then allowing them to produce more coherent and contextually relevant responses so what you require are the prompts then versatility in the application uh, it can perform wide uh, range of tasks that we'll uh, discuss and then therefore it is a val valuable tool in various industries from healthcare to finance to content creation to customer services so what are the uses of and where we can use in research one is the text generation you know you, you will just put ki write me a paper for particular this thing okay or if you want to write a case paper write me a case paper for prolapse uterus uh, a case coming to you for the prolapse uterus you will just give giving uh, it a prompt like write me a case paper so now the prompt how precise your prompt it is important for the precise text generation okay so it can be useful in generating content for research papers reports and summaries second thing you can summarize the text already we have seen in earlier uh, uh, presentations how to summarize the text and I, i will not go in details about that language translation uh, one of the exclusion criteria is paper not written in english so here you can use this and uh, that llm will translate uh, that paper in uh, english language or in your language also then extraction of the information information extraction uh if you want a specific uh, information uh, from a large amount of data then that can also be extracted and collaborative writing so uh, two or three researchers sitting there and they will give different different prompt and you can write collaboratively on the llm data analysis as you know you just sir already told ki excel sheet aapke paas hai you just put that data in the llm and he will tell you what to do how to analyze the data uh which test you want to carry out on that specific data and all these things okay so statistical analysis has become very easy by this even idea generation now why i put this idea generation last because i think we should generate our own idea and then we should ask llm okay so what is the limitation the main limitation is the potential bias in training the data suppose you are using chat gpt 3.5 now the data is up to 2022 so you will not get the recent data and therefore your research will be limited okay so careful validation of the generated data is required now coming to the ethical consideration one thing is the privacy and confidentiality of the patient or the patient data or any data what you want to put Uh, even in some guidelines as like bmj said ki you can't write it a patient coming to you uh, with a 25 years old you have to write it as a mid 20s mid 30s like that okay uh, and what we do hum case paper likhne bolenge we will say ki a patient from hingna region name this 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 age this this so that you cannot do over here 
okay then there can be a bias and fairness uh transparency and explainability uh they are often considered as a black box llm and researchers should strive for transparency in their use of llm providing clear explanations that the model decisions and the outputs then inform concern uh, if you are using anything uh, ai or llm on patients so you should inform you should have inform consent from the patients that you you are using that specific model quality of the information you have to ensure the quality clinical validation so you cannot rely on the data generated from the llm you have to validate it personally professional responsibility you have to critically evaluate and validate the outputs of this model they should not be blindly accepted in the security concerns medical data is sensitive as you all know so there are again security concerns regulatory compliance ensure that the use of llm in medical research compliance with relevant regulation and standard uh, till date i don't think uh, so many regulations are there regarding how to use all these things llm and all these things uh, data protection laws ethical guidelines established by the medical and research organizations actually there are guidelines in organizations uh, some people write uh, one of the co-author as chat gpt and all these things and there should be continu continuous monitoring and updating of all this llm if you want to generate true data or precise data so in conclusion it offers a great promise but it requires careful consideration and its ethical implication thank you very much fantastic fantastic lecture bankar sir so as we all know he is our lead i mean vice dean research and development cell at dmmc and he will be taking the workshop soon after these couple of two talks uh i have got one suggestion for all the students who are with me see uh, all of you have got gmails right so there is a function called as google doc with you right so imagine all of you has turn on your computer on the google doc and shared that google doc between all of you and take simultaneous notes on this particular session at the same time what kind of a quality content you can create by just single lecture and it will be inputs from each one of you on that single document so that is also ai and that is applied intelligence so what we are trying to reiterate throughout this day throughout this talk is that use these tools to make your understanding and your learning better getting my point okay next okay. next look sir uh, as such you have to validate your data means uh, you can use chat gpt for proof reading uh, for grammar syntax error and all these things but you cannot generate a whole text from you can generate some ideas suppose if you are if you are uh, writing any narrative review if you if you are having five sub subheadings in that you can ask whether he will give you 10 or 15 subheadings then wisely you have to choose whether you want to write about this five or six subheadings or not second thing you can use it for grammar syntax and all these things but you cannot write a whole paper from that sandeep sir has already told you can generate uh, bibliography and all these things so, so can i jump into the uh, discussion uh, yeah. what we can use chat gpt or for that matter uh, these llm is that it's a brainstorming tool okay you can bounce that idea on and off so it will make your idea better so it is like someone who is listening to you without judging you and providing a informative content who has got it at its disposal the entire internet or for that matter to the amount of degree like chat gpt4 has got add ons or uh, plugins which are available throughout the net okay so additional content it will give you the context in which you are asking that particular question you are getting my point suppose say like, let's talk about pharmacology let's talk about uh, uh, use of haloperidol in gilly stula torret syndrome i don't know whether it is still relevant or not okay so if you keep on asking regarding the said side effects of haloperidol in gilly stola torret syndrome or the usages of it okay and if you ask what are the other medications or whether it can form or a better drug in terms of genetic markup or something like that it has got any effect so it will give you a related content 
then maybe you can refine your idea about that particular thing just just Later just on. my uh, way of saying it sir will be done what is the advantage of chat gpt 4 over 3 it is paid paid access and of course uh, the availability of plugins the data advanced so of course version. a more advanced version and there are a lot of plugins which are available plugins basically as uh, dr neeraj uh, neeraj yeah. bijlani has shown you yeah, yeah. so with PDF the AI advantage of chat gpt 4 there are uh, plugins of dali which is a regenerative content uh, creator at your disposal moreover it is more informative you can web search and it will it will give you insights regarding whatever exactly is current whereas chat gpt's knowledge is limited to 2021 board events so if you ask about the recent content and ask a insight it will maybe give you a hallucinogenic or a, a bad response or a review one one example i can give just uh, i use the chat gpt for uh, say uh, reducing the plagiarism and the word was something coming out, coming out of the wazir तो so, मुझे ना दो दिन लगे कि वो किसी बच्चे ने करके लाया था मैं बोला ये है क्या दो दिन लगे मुझे ये करने के लिए कि ये उसने तो चेंज करके दिया दैट वाज प्रोलैप्स यू तरस सो बहुत वाइजली हमें यूज करना पड़ता है उसको uh, ऐसा नहीं है कि वो पूरा का पूरा हमें पूरा अच्छे से देगा करके सो सो वी विल गो हेड विद द नेक्स्ट टॉक एंड देन थैंक यू शिवस सौरभ सर I now invite the deputy director, research and development DMMC, Dr. Saurabh Srivastav, to speak about AI safety. so good afternoon everyone i'll be talking about uh, artificial intelligence safety so i must thank uh, dr ashay because this was not my topic and he has taken me out of my comfort zone so i'll still uh, maybe previously i'll go uh there are three learning objectives for my session that uh, first uh, i want to enumerate some incidents related to ai safety followed by what are the potential risk and challenges when we are using artificial intelligence and lastly we will see some ai safety related guidelines which uh, dr bankar was mentioning so to begin with i think uh, all of you since morning have been listening to that uh, ai has application in so many fields and yes it is there very much but the question arises anything that comes has its negative side also so there are some positives and there are some negatives or challenges as well now we stand in as part of this session we look for those challenges which are there but knowing that this thing has so many advantages what we will develop a cancer biopsies other way diagnosis not only one one area parts of it then listen friends bad with a friend Still, don't know how much it will. It now we are in other concerns also. So because it was learning from what people were giving responses, there were some mistakes, and then it got uh, immediately taken back. 
next comes uh, something about uh, amazon uh, in the year 2018 amazon started something called as artificial intelligence recruitment uh, so ai technology was used to recruit staff now the problem what happened is because i think uh, sandeep sir also mentioned and even bankar sir said that everything depends upon the quality of input uh, what you are giving so what was happening this app or whatever this artificial intelligence went behind and checked about what kind of people are generally being selected in and through in this company so they found that uh, it uh, it is about more females who were selected therefore when that kind of data was fed into ai automatically more and more female employees were selected and uh, then this was like a gender based it became a gender based hiring tool so again this one also got stopped uh moving ahead there was another incident i hope you all will be aware about this this is a lady who was driving an automated car uh and in the year 2018 while she was driving she was looking at her mobile and the car was running on her own this car went and hit a pedestrian that person died then and there in the year 18 and in the year 2023 finally the judgment came where they found that uh, she is some uh, uh like uh, she was found culprit and she was given 3 years of imprisonment another incident is with regard to facial recognition so this is like in the year 2020 and i think uh, here what happened is that they enlarged all ai things and identified that some person has done some kind of crime and then based on that he was sentenced to jail and all later on it was found that it was wrong so but then it became a cause of concern because this was the third time it was happening and it was mainly black people who were getting targeted again and again so, and similar kind of things even happened with the, like facial uh, morphism which is happening where our features are different and face you are putting of someone else and so many such incidents are happening now so with that we can say that ai safety has become a cause of concern for all of us and uh, this takes us to the next part of my talk where we will think about uh, this is something which i have generated using ai it is like mind map so there are so many challenges and probably we will see some of them like bias and fairness so this is nothing but what kind of data you will feed that kind of out output only you will get so any time if it is your input is not good like as i said about uh, that uh, Uh, amazon recruitment because the data which was given was with regard to female employees being selected more so everyone who were selected were female only next way is with regard to security vulnerability so because you all know that uh, this is all ai means everywhere technology is involved so it at the same time it becomes very much vulnerable to uh, some kind of misuse if you i don't know how many of you have seen this uh, maybe next part of my talk is with regard to some movies and some stills and some clips and i'll ask question based on that so i'll ask you to please come back anyone has seen this movie no this came last year on netflix it is nothing but she herself is a hacker and uh, she was trapped in some kind of controversy where while a bus which was first launched in one country it was totally automated and that bus was again hacked so it was about to uh, one function they, this vehicle was about to hit and kill many people some controversy over there so this becomes quite uh, means vulnerability with regard to security then unintended consequences as i told whatever we think probably every time it will not result into the same like for example as i said the idea was in that incident of uh, automated driver idea was how best you can drive without uh, minimizing human efforts and uh, reducing human error but actually what happened untoward consequences somebody died uh, next is uh, job displacement so we all can say even uh, sir was mentioning just now that our mind can work only for 8 hours and they can work almost 3 times so we ex can expect that there are so many things which people will come and displace uh, ai will take care of uh, our job and it is high time that we should uh, take steps next is about privacy concerns 
so this is again uh, i don't know this is i think uh, now this comes a lot in star gold and all those things this is some tamil or telugu movie which has been dubbed in hindi this is an army officer this hero and he submit some of his pan card aadhar card all those things in bank for some loan and what happens is that his documents are hacked by this person and his entire money whatever is sanctioned by the company everything is gone so in a single day the entire money is gone so it is like even your how many times we are worried about where all our aadhar cards whenever we are going it can be hacked so this is something like uh, privacy issue ethical dilemmas always uh, that there is some or the other kind of concern where we don't know whether to do or not especially human can take their call but whether we can say the same thing with regard to ai then there are regulatory challenges sir was just mentioning whether there are so many laws available to do that then inequality in access it is like many of us have access to ai but many of us they don't have so when who those people who do not have this access it becomes difficult and there is some kind of this environmental impact in mainly in terms of if you want to uh, proliferate ai there are lot of computers this that everything is being used and simultaneously there is increase in generation of e waste that is electronic waste then cultural and social impact i'll show you with an, an example uh, then over reliance is there explainability and interpretability mainly in the sense that not everybody can understand i think sir just mentioned we need not think about how it is being operated rather how best we can use it so this is in terms of how best we can explain dependability many times this is repeatedly coming everywhere what kind of data which you are inputting that kind of output only you will get back and last one is human ai collaborative issue so in what best way human and ai are collaborating so always they will not listen to us probably whatever we are doing the same kind of response we will not get i think khadi sir just asked that what response we ask probably the same thing will not come unless we are very much particular about the prompt which we are putting so with that maybe uh the same thing if we reverse they are nothing but the principles of using artificial intelligence uh now there are some guidelines uh, i think bankar sir mentioned whether there are not many guidelines but yes there are some guidelines some guideline the first one which talks about uh, transparency accountability and ethical consideration there is another guideline which again talks about fairness transparency accountability and collaboration how best we can collaborate with that i will take you to something which is there in india what all guidelines are there so this is the document which is released by icmr this year itself how best we can use it in healthcare biomedical research and healthcare and there is another draft which has already come means it is in digital draft policy act which will come soon into existence so some policies are there and now we move on to the activity so anyone has seen this movie i think many of you yes so now based on uh, i explained one mind map so i would like to comment uh, invite your responses do you think in this movie there is an inequality in access think or maybe i will not discuss everything because it is paucity of time so anybody so i will give you one example say for example he was the villain who was not having access to chitti that the robo and whatever he was having everything was turning out to be waste so there is some kind of inequality at least over there so moving on to any environmental impact yes because so many killing this that everything happened so definitely it was there any cultural and societal impact wait like give the narration girl suicide nahi it is about this yeah actually this incident only when you see i don't know how many of you have seen this is like uh, a girl is stuck in the fire and uh, the developer asked the robo get me that girl somehow so he goes and get her without any clothes because of which she feels very much offended and she commits suicide so this is how you can uh, what uh, adult learning principle or medical education always says that 
we should provide relevance to our education so this example is something like where you can relate to everything now this is okay dependence on data quality do you think it was there in the movie am anuradha ma'am you have seen no okay ji so if you all remember the earlier version which was designed by the developer that is rajni he was not having emotions so when he went for that test while he was running he stabbed his owner himself so what they told this thing doesn't have emotion so next what they did they added an extra component of emotion into that and then it led to the entire movie so yes data quality was very much there so like that if we go everything if you want you can correlate i have put only one more thing no no wait wait <laughs> so this is something about job displacement so this talks nothing about uh, this is the army test where uh, he goes and uh, there they ask him this is the robot which can replace almost 1000 worker on border this that so this is nothing but where the robo will go and work on our borders and take care of so many manpower okay so like this you can do analyze everything and think about relevance how best it is relevant to you when you are using ai in your thing i leave this uh, talk with one video no this is one take home message so as i mentioned there are multiple benefits of ai but there are so many other concerns also and we should be very careful while we are using it so one video i same movie so this <coughs> i chau sara tv khol do tu amma khol do bolo ki to khol hi dega na tv on karo aise saaf saaf bolna chahiye Sorry. So this is nothing but what I mentioned about the quality of input. So they have told about you have to do like this. So it did like that. So if we want to correlate with our next session, so this is nothing but uh, importance of prompt prompts. So when you are using Chat GPT, see to it that you use best prompt. Otherwise, you, such kind of incidents can happen. So thank you so much. Any queries? Before the workshops and fantastic talk, Doctor Sir, fantastic. I mean, it was really, really. How can I say? Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like a, a, a right composition of uh, exactly what we wanted to intend uh, and uh, uh, a astute uh, thing for a curtain raiser. So before we uh, break for the workshop, we have just one lecture left. Uh, Dr. Aditya will be speaking about the use of uh, artificial intelligence in simulation. Ah, huh. the mic, please. So my one query is that how the prompts can be missed. Prompts will not be missed. The way you will, huh? Huh? How to make the best prompts? It is by learning by doing. so once you start doing what madam showed in the during her inauguration session as you do you will learn the best thing is never to ask see chat gpt has some constraints with regard to maximum 3600 characters it can generate so what you should do is always ask for outline whatever you want to write ask about outline give an outline for any specific topic it will just give headings then subsequently for each subheading you ask can you explain in say 10 points this heading or can you give five examples for this can you talk like as specific as possible you have to be in to in order to get what you actually want there is something we will get to learn during the workshop bankar sir will tell so yeah thank you thank you very much sir sir just as a small token of our appreciation i would like to request dr ajay khade to Felicitated Dr. Saurabh Srivastav with a memento as a token of our appreciation. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Aditya Kekatpure, Associate Professor, Department of Orthopedics, JNMC Varda, speaking about the emerging shifts in simulation and AI. Thank you, Dejas, and uh, 
thank you saurabh sir for uh, bringing the old memories of stanley medical college like when when i was in chennai and i remember watching that movie early in the morning around 6 am because the theater was full so i'll uh, uh, this will be the last talk and i'll try to keep it very short and uh, uh, frankly speaking i am going into the world of simulation since last one year since the, uh, since the time we have started collaborating with mayo clinic usa and i'll be talking regarding that also so so basically what is simulation in health it refers to uh, imitation or replication of a particular clinical scenario and uh, i'm going to keep it very short uh, or any procedure or patient interaction for the purpose of training healthcare professionals so it is similar to what we do in uh, aviation uh, what it does it basically uh, simulating the same thing repeatedly and we, it uh, decreases the number of accidents and also it improves the uh, pilot skills so as compared to conventional teaching like didactic lecture how simulation is better it uh, first thing is that improves patient encounters so in simulation we will have a controlled practice for diverse scenarios it minimizes randomness it can cover rare and critical cases which is not possible in a traditional teaching teaching also it ensures patient mm -hmm. safety that uh, and uh, it can help the learner the new one to learn without making mistakes uh, with by making mistakes but without consequences also it promotes scenario repetition for skill re reinforcement and also ensures consistent exposure to specific cases mm -hmm. then again uh, the best thing about simulation is that we can at the end of that we can have a objective assessment and feedback of the learner this is not possible in a real life situation uh, all the time and also it can help in uh, going to the interprofessional collaborations we can uh, develop that in the in the world of simulation now coming to its importance in medical training simulation plays a critical crucial role in medical education by providing a self and controlled environment for healthcare professionals and also it bridges the gap between theoretical knowledge and practical application so now what are the various types of simulation uh, it can be a mannequin based it can be standardized patient simulation it can be virtual patient simulation or it can be team based simulation so now as uh, now is it uh, restricted only to the newcomers no it has a very serious very significant role for the continuous professional development of even the most learned person what it does is that it allows one to refine it, the existing skills learn new procedures and also to stay updated on advancement in healthcare so now let us go through the history of simulation in healthcare what has happened it started in 1950 when there was early simulators the early mannequins were there then the, there was advancement in 1970 to 900, 1990 in the form of mannequins coming in and then in 1990 to 2000 uh, then came the uh, computer based simulation now as it has improved further there was uh, inclusion of virtual reality and augmented reality in simulation and now we are in the world of ai where it is making lot of uh, contributions in the world of simulation so now what what is upcoming in the world of simulation how it is going further there has been incorporation of haptic feedback we have this available at our center in uh, seva uh, savangi uh, what haptic feedback does is that it makes virtual rea uh, uh, virtual reality surgery feel like real thing so one can perform a surgery and get the feedbacks uh, while doing that this is available for laparoscopy training at our center then again extended reality applications like it enhances simulation experience and integration of mixed reality for diverse training now coming to role of ai in simulation there are numerous papers that have been published now coming to the role of uh, artificial intelligence uh, for that and what it's what they have concluded is that it has a significant role but there are concerns regarding accuracy relevance and structure of the products produced by chat gpt ai program now then so now uh, if we try to use this properly so try to understand a pediatric resident who is just in first year and he wants to study a case of sepsis in a pediatric child so it is very difficult to get get a case first of all and if he gets gets a case it is most of the time handled by the consultant because it is very critical so now in this case 
they have developed a physi physical virtual patient simulator and this they have done you know by simulating a pediatric patient uh, by creating a sepsis scenario so in that case what they found out that in that case the uh, the simulator was able to exhibit range of multi sensory cues including visual cues like capillary refill facial expressions appearance changes auditory cues like verbal responses heart sounds and tactile cues so try to understand at the end of this a resident with or without who will be better equipped to handle a current scenario you are getting my point so this is definitely one thing where there is a significant scope of simulation in medical education so now uh, there is a there are papers regarding role of artificial intelligence in surgical simulation it uh, they have concluded that ai can definitely improve surgical training by evaluating performance like suppose i am a pelvic astrabular surgeon and uh, if i go on operating something but i i am not getting a feedback at the end of my surgery what i did right and what i did wrong so what if it, at the end of each surgery i get a feedback that what were, what went right and what went wrong so next time i'll be better prepared so similarly with the help of ai this feedback will make me a better surgeon at the end and this is what they have uh, studied but there are couple of limitations regarding this this is what covered was covered by aditi that it need requires a significant amount of data and for getting it expert in this field it will require exorbitant volume of surgical data to train the uh, machine learning algorithm effectively and right now currently there is lack of validated assessment criteria against which the ai algorithm should be should assess participants performance so this is something that needs to be improved upon so now whether artificial intelligence and in healthcare simulation whether it is a hype or hope so now yes like any other new technology it will have its own learning curve because it itself is learning right now but over time using ai will become a common part of simulation based education program and until then we should use it as a tool to support simulation based learning but to recognize its limitation so with this i would like to invite you all uh, to the simulation instructor course which is going to be conducted at our uh, uh, savangi uh, center in the month of february and uh, it is in collaboration with mayo clinic usa so we are going to have three faculties visiting us from mayo and uh, it is a very restricted slot we only have slot for 24 participants and already 13 have joined the program in this after joining this course one he or she will be a mayo certified instructor okay so this is going to be a very uh, exciting experience for all of us so i hereby invite you all for this event with this thank you for your kind attention thank you very much may i please request dr Ajay Khade sir and Dr. Ashish Kekatpure sir to felicitate Dr. Aditya Kekatpure with a memento as a token of our appreciation. Next, I would like to request Dr. Saurabh Shrivastav sir to present Dr. Bankar sir with a memento as a token of our appreciation. and now i would like to request dr bankar sir to present a memento as a token of our appreciation to dr ashay kekatpure sir and last but not the least i request dr aditya kekatpure to present 
a moment to as a token of our appreciation to dr ajay khade sir and uh, i kindly request dr ashe to felicitate dr tejas for a wonderful anchoring and he has been the most wonderful moc i have ever seen thank you tejas uh this brings us to the almost uh, end of this particular or wonderful curtain raiser as we may say it has been a learning experience organizing this thinking about it and planning it and uh, as i told you during my talk uh, we have been thinking about it for a long time just before the pandemic and this has come to a fruition after uh, much thought deliberation lot of hurdles overcoming them i dr bankar sir khade sir saurabh shivasa sir used to sit in the student hub and think about how we are going to plan and execute it in spite of that we are very much thankful to the uh, management especially uh, dean ma'am vice dean sir and the entire uh, dmhr group for taking this idea uh, to a extent seriously and seeing it. one question i want you all to uh, go out Uh, from here today is that have this deliberation in mind that this technology or uh, this applied artificial intelligence is going to affect us in all possible ways and this could be a forum where you come back as i told you with your questions and we can discuss and we can formulate plans and pathways to uh, to understand it better so it is like a i mean imagine it uh, analogically speaking it is like a big giant wave which is approaching us and we are all standing on the shore okay so we have got two options left with us either we can prepare our surf boards and enjoy the ride on this big wave giant wave or be submerged by it so the decision is entirely up to us it is up to us how we prepare that snowboard there is a famous saying in park's tech park's tech book which is for psm that it wasn't raining when noha prepared his ark so this is our time it's not raining yet okay with that thank you thanks a lot you have been a wonderful audience for the students or for the students mbba students and mh students who are here you can follow for the workshop with dr bankar sir he and his team will uh, definitely help you out after the session okay and i'm very thankful to everyone who has been a part of the cme uh, online and present thank you thanks a lot thank you to the yash team for fantastic uh, av management and uh, ortho tv team for hosting this event online thank you have a uh, good night and have a happy weekend thank you We can have a question answer session if you want. If you have any questions we can have a recording